Would you like to have a cup of coffee? He just likes a glass. Huh? Don't worry about it. This is March 19th, 1984. This is David Robbins. I'm here at the home of Richard Berry in Jamestown, and we'll be discussing the Fall River Line and the uh, repair shops that were located on the point. Now, I've started the tape, and uh, so we can just uh, talk about things, and uh, it will all be recorded there. Well, the the period really that I can talk about with some personal recollection was probably about 1917 to 1927, mm -hmm. or more or less in that range. Yes. Um, my father was superintendent in the Newport shops there, came from New York in 1913, and he, he died in 1927. And after that we went on our various ways. So our Newport history is in that in that range of time. Yeah. Um, I was quite interested in the yard just because it fascinated me. I was I used to go down there, and I guess I was a horrifying nuisance around there. <laughs> but uh, I, I got to know the various foremen and the people around the yard, and they were very nice to me. And, and I guess uh, quite a few times they liked to chase me out of the place, but they didn't. <laughs> So I got to know the the shop side of it. Yes. And as you probably know, the reason for the for that installation down there, which was not Long Wharf, it was the next wharf north of Long Wharf, uh, which had the big derrick, the big shear leg derrick on it, and had the shops as they were called, the boiler shop, machine shop, carpenter shop, and storehouses and uh, upholstery repair and all linen shop and all that kind of stuff, and the powerhouse. And then the, sh the pier north of that was Briggs Wharf. And that's, I guess, now where the bridge goes over to the torpedo station. Yes, I think that's right. Approximately speaking, yes. uh -huh. anyway. And uh, that area there was used ba basically for the maintenance and repair of the vessels owned by the Fall River Line, which were, were fairly extensive. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many there were now at that particular time, uh, but there were the four principal boats of the Fall River Line, the Commonwealth, Priscilla, Providence, and Plymouth. But then there were the boats that ran to, to New Bedford and New London. And during a period of, period of time, there was a, a Providence Line, mm -hmm. which ran in competition with the Joy Line, I think it was called. And then they had uh, freight boats that uh, uh, ran, they didn't carry any passengers, just freight, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, and then they also were responsible for the uh, New Bedford Nantucket line, mm -hmm. which, while well, well, it didn't affect Newport, they all came to Newport for repairs. Yes. And all those vessels in the course of the years had to have their, uh, their steamboat inspection uh, certificates updated and they had to have the physical repairs to maintain them, and there's quite a quite a shop there. I can't remember how many men were employed, but I would guess in the range, depending on the activity, of 350 to maybe as many as 500. Mm -hmm. And don't don't uh, hang your hat on those figures. Right. That's just my yes. guess. Yes. Uh, most of them were ex expert craftsmen. They were just the finest type that you could find anywhere in their particular trades. Mm -hmm. Like machinists and electricians and electricity was in its, in its younger days in, in, in that time. Um, carpenters, joiner work. Um, the joiner work was incredible as you just mentioned talking yes. about this stuff. And one of the interesting things about the joiner work that always used to fascinate me was that I don't believe there was a 90 degree angle anywhere in one of those mm -hmm. vessels. And you could look up the sweep of the corridors or in the public rooms there and everything was shaped to the to the hull, to the shear and to the camber of the vessel and to the, and to the ship's lines and plan. Yeah. And as I say, I, I don't think there was a 90 degrees in the, anywhere in the 
in the joiner work. Get those fellows worked at that stuff and put it together, and it was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. You look at some of the photographs of the interiors, oh, and I'm it's, sure you have. It, it's stunning. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's the kind of thing they had to maintain, or if there was damage or something like that, they had to replace this stuff, mm -hmm. and they had that capability. They were top-notch people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the painters, that, that stuff all had to be painted, and it was painted and gold-leafed, and the, the richness of it was incredible. They had carpets to worry about. They had, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of bed sheets and blankets and pillowcases. They had a big linen room there in, in the yard. And uh, that all was done in that one repair yard for those 20 some vessels. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I can recall that wasn't done in the maintenance and upkeep and uh, of those vessels was dry docking. And of course we had no dry dock up up here that, would, that was big enough to handle them. And they used to take the boats down Long Island Sound on what they called a day trip. Mm -hmm. Big deal, because they always ran at night. But uh, to take them oh. from the shops down to dry dock, they'd run them down during the day, uh -huh. simply because you could get a day crew and you, you know, uh, it was quite an experience to go down Long Island Sound for those fellows during the day. Hmm. And they'd go into uh, Tijin and Lang or Fletcher's and Hoboken, mm -hmm. uh, where they had floating dry docks there. And they put them in there, and it was quite a sight to yeah, see one of right. those yes. vessels yeah. in the dry dock. Oh. Do what had to be done, take it to the paddle wheels, although most of the work on the paddle wheels was done right in Newport because they could rotate the wheels and put new buckets, as they called them, which mm -hmm. you maybe call them paddles, and uh, repair the, the mechanism there. Yeah. So I think most everything was done. As I say, electricity was in its infancy, but the Pilgrim, I think it was, back a hundred years or so ago, was the first electrically lighted vessel of its kind. There had been some partial installations, but the electric light was the f was this was the first vessel completely mm -hmm. equipped with electric lights, huh. even yeah. before the White House in, in Washington <laughs> had them. That was quite exciting. They all also were fitted with radio or tele uh, wireless, as they called it in those days, um, and most of that came under the under the electrician's department. There was a, a man there during my time that I remember, and a lot of other people in Newport remember his name. His name was Everett Minkler, and he was the foreman electrician. And today, if you looked at it, you'd think it was an antique, but in those days, it did what it was supposed to, and it generated the electricity, and mm -hmm. these fellows took care of all the circuits and the lights and the carbon filament bulbs and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Uh, well, that's only by way of saying that the men who worked in that place were craftsmen, yes. top-notch craftsmen, and they were proud of their work. Um, most of them lived on the point or, or thereabouts. Um, some lived in the town, like Mr. Florence Sullivan, who was foreman boilermaker earlier in, when, I, when I first remember him, lived on Mount Vernon Street. He had five daughters, handsome ladies they were too, and they all were all school teachers in, oh. <laughs> in the Newport schools. And uh -huh. I don't think any of them ever married. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan was a fine, sturdy uh, guy, and to see him on Sunday, you'd figure he was certainly a pillar of the church. <laughs> but the other five and a half days a week, or nights, or whenever they worked, he was a he was a magnificent craftsman, mm -hmm. and they could build their own. I don't think they built big boilers in the shop, but I know they built their own donkey boilers. Now, what, uh, what would that be? Well, that's a, a small boiler uh, that uh, you had on most of these ships to maintain steam and heat and and uh, some degree of electricity when you were laid up, oh, I see. when you didn't need the, the main power plant mm -hmm. for propulsion. Uh -huh. So they had these donkey boilers, and, and they just kept the ships warm and uh, lighted and mm -hmm. safe. You could run a fire pump if you had to. Yeah. And enough steam in the donkey boiler to run a fire pump. 
Uh, uh, you mentioned that the uh, most of the, the men lived in the point. Well, uh, I would say this, that in those days you walked to work. And the logical place for them to live was in the neighborhood somewhere. Yes. I, I, maybe I'm overstating it. I'm sure some of them came perhaps even from the Fifth Ward. My own father used to walk four miles a day because we lived about a mile. We lived up on the hill, Reno Place, and he walked to work every morning, came home for lunch, walked back, and then came home in the evening and walked the uh, was, was good exercise. Yeah. yeah, so that's quite a quite a chunk out of his day too. <laughs> yeah, but you walk because that's how you got there. Yes, yeah. yeah. There were there were tram cars, street cars in Newport, but uh, they didn't go in the right direction for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, mostly they ran, well, it was one, well, we won't get into that anyway, because yeah. that's another subject. Um, I think that that's what impressed me most about the yard down there, was the, the expert, uh, the, the craftsmanship of the men, particularly the foreman and the other, um, um, what do you call these people, journeymen, I guess, mm -hmm. who knew their, knew their business. And they could yeah. tackle anything. And if there was an accident, a couple of a couple of the boats hit each other or something like that, they'd bring the boat in there and rip out what had to be ripped out, and put it all together again, and working 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. particularly if it was in the summer when they wanted all the boats. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I remember quite a few of the of the people, but I don't think you want to get into naming naming them. I don't believe it really means too much. Well, we uh, uh, we might. I'm not sure really uh, exactly. Well, let me uh, just name a few well, sure. to run through them, and if you want to look into it further, we can always mm -hmm. go back. Yeah. Uh, originally, the place was under the management of a Mr. George Pierce, who was uh, an, uh, a naval architect and who built was responsible for the construction of the all the boats. Uh, I guess from the Puritan and, and uh, Pilgrim through the Priscilla. Mm -hmm. Then there was a gap in time. I don't know whether Mr. Pierce passed away or, or just what happened. But anyhow, uh, a man named J. Holland Gardner, who was a Newport boy, uh, went down there and was employed and became Mr. Pierce's successor. And during his time, he uh, was one of the major factors in designing the Commonwealth, and that was the last, latest, and greatest of the Fall River Line boats. Mm -hmm. She came out in 1908, I think it was. A little different style and uh, a little different concept. And uh, they were all interesting, the big ones, because they were side wheelers. Uh, so, well, why? If, if you could use propellers, did they use paddle wheels? Uh, that doesn't have much to do with the Newport shops, excepting that the shops had to be able to maintain these gigantic, big, reciprocating steam engines to drive the uh, paddle wheels. Mm -hmm. Now those were um, um, unusual in, in that uh, that age, were they not? They were. They were unusual to this extent that in 19 well, let's say the early 1900s, if I'm right, uh, tur the turbine, the steam turbine was invented. Mr. Parsons, who was an Englishman, uh, invented the steam turbine and he had a little boat called the Turbina or Turbania, I forget, that he ran up and down the Solent in, in Southampton in England with this neat little turbine in it. And uh, the Bath Ironworks, and I suppose others, uh, got licenses and built turbine-driven vessels for, well, the Camden and the Belfast were two of them. They later ran from New York to Providence up until the 50s, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they names for the minute. Anyhow, the, the availability of turbines was there, and the decision had to be made when they designed the Commonwealth, why do we want turbines, or do we want the old-fashioned a paddle wheel. Uh, 
I don't, I don't know what the final decision. I know what the final decision was, or what the arguments were. I think was something like this: that the Commonwealth was a big vessel, and she was built to run to Fall River. Fall River. I think the depth of water to Fall River was something like not more than 15 feet in those days. And in order to build a, a boat the size of the Commonwealth, which is 450 feet long, uh, to only draw 15 feet of water, you just didn't have enough hull to get the propellers down in the water where they would be efficient. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. Uh, it would give you an efficient propulsion. Mm -hmm. On the smaller vessels, yes, because you didn't have to absorb 10,000 horsepower. That's what the Commonwealth had, roughly speaking, 10,000 horsepower. And uh, even the Camden and the Belfast had to have three engines, three propellers on them, uh, with, the, with the draft limitation and the high speed, because no, they didn't have reduction gears in those days. And the decision was we'll go with the paddle wheels. Mm -hmm. And they did. And they were, they were fa fascinating. Uh, instruments. Yes. Yeah. Uh, each one of those paddle wheels weighed 150 tons oh. <laughs> on the on the uh, Commonwealth, and I think the Priscilla was much less. Mm -hmm. And one of the characteristics of the Newport shops was that great big shear leg derrick that they had on the south west corner of the pier of the shops, the mm -hmm. other shops yeah. uh, the, uh, facility there. I don't remember what that uh, derrick was. It must have been a hundred feet tall, I guess, and then it had a flagpole on top of that. Mm. But you can see it in loads of the pictures. Yes, a big uh, derrick, and that had the capability of lifting. The, the limit on it was eighty tons. Uh, the boilers it was mainly used for reboilering. Taking out, for instance, there's a lot of history of taking out the old Scotch boilers out of all those old boats and putting water tube boilers in. Babcock and Wilcox water tube boilers, mm -hmm. which had come into their own in World War I in naval uh, construction and propulsion. Babcock and Wilcox incidentally happened to come from Westerly, Rhode Island, the two men mm -hmm. oh, that invented the boiler yes, uh -huh. and built them over there. And uh, the the old boilers, I was trying to remember what those old Scotch boilers, when they pulled them out of their weight, but they must have weighed 30, 40 tons anyway. And the new water tube boilers were lighter and more efficient. They didn't weigh so much. But that's what the derrick was used for. They'd uh, uh, take the smokestacks out and put them down somewhere on the, on the dock and uh, take these boilers out through the escape where the smokestacks and uptakes went up and, and then put the new ones down in and mm -hmm. connect them all up mm -hmm. and that was all took some craftsmanship. Yeah. Those, those fellows had to know what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, the, would you explain the shear leg derrick? I don't know uh, this was, how this, that would appear. Well, the standing part of it was like a mast. Mm -hmm. Only it was, in this case it was a two-legged mast. It went up in a, in a point like this and was stayed back across with big, heavy, those stays maybe two and a half inches in mm -hmm. diameter that were grounded around the sh in the yard toward the north, east, and west, but mainly toward the north because mm -hmm. the derrick faced and worked toward the south. Mm -hmm. And the vessel that was being served by it laid, it laid in that slip uh, on the south side of the shop. Yes. Dock there. Mm -hmm. The other part of it was a very similar structure, but uh, a, a, an A, f a very long, narrow A-frame. Uh, but it was hinged at the bottom, mm -hmm. and it's it, and at the top it had a, um, oh, I guess about a 12-part tackle at the top, so that you could uh, let it swing out like that. In other words, okay. you could. Uh, Top that boom up, or you could swing it out so you could reach up okay. over the hatch, yes, the uh, boiler room hatch. Yeah, yeah. And then, when you wanted to bring it up, you could bring it up so it was almost vertical, right. not quite. Yeah. Now, to the end of that boom, that movable boom, mm -hmm. was a big tackle, a big double tackle with a, a blocks, two hanging blocks on it. The blocks must have been 
oh, close to five feet in diameter, I guess. <laughs> By blocks, you know yes, what I mean. Yes. There, was a, with a, there was a fixed tackle at the top, and then the two running blocks. And I think there were about six block tackles each one. And down at the foot of the derrick was a steam hoisting arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a little house there with a boiler in it, and two steam engines. Uh, I forget just exactly the layout now, but one engine worked the topping lift, which in effect let the boom go down. Or down and out, or topped it back up again, yeah. and the other one ran the uh, the two blocks, mm -hmm. and uh, and the same engine ran the, ran each block, but you could clutch in one or the other, or normally it'd run them both at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that enabled you to swing this derrick out over the over the uh, fire room uh, hatch. And drop the blocks, uh, one or two blocks down in there, sling up whatever you had to sling up, like a whole boiler, and pick it up, swing it back out over the over the land, over there was a landing underneath this uh, derrick, it was far enough back, so you had a, right. an apron yes. uh, and a railroad track on it. You could bring that stuff down, drop it on a flat car, or with those Scotch boilers, we dropped them down and turned them. 90 degrees and just rolled them out into the yard out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the that was a the dominant feature that yes. derrick. Everybody knows that, and all the photographs of old Newport waterfront shows it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that was the, the purpose of it. Another another one of its main purposes was in handling the paddle wheel work. Which let's say you needed to put a new shaft in. Sometimes these shafts that the paddle wheels that drove the paddle wheels would mm. get they'd break or crack or they'd find d defects in them or maybe just the bearings would wear and they would either have to take the shaft out and, and uh, true up the bearings or put a new shaft in. Each shaft weighed 22 tons. That's just mm. a piece of, of, of steel 30 inches in diameter. 30 uh, inches in diameter? 30 inches in diameter. Uh, the ones I remember had a 10-inch bore, and they just they had a 10-inch hole bored through them, mm -hmm. presumably um, to make them a little lighter to handle. Yeah. And also, it gave you a better inspection if you had a 10-inch hole in the shaft. Mm -hmm. You could you could at least look in there with a flashlight and see if there were any fissures or any signs of any defects, mm -hmm. which you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Yeah, it's put a mirror with a light in there. Mm -hmm. um, what did I say they weighed? Twenty-two or three tons? Yeah, something like that. And when, uh, when you had to change one of those shafts, you had to pick the weight of the paddle wheel. On well, the Commonwealth, the paddle wheel, the one wheel, weighed in the neighborhood of 150 tons. And you pick that up with this derrick down through a little, a little hole in the top of the paddle wheel housing, uh -huh. sling it up uh, on on I beams. And uh, no, well, on high beams, yes. Lift it just enough to take the weight off the shaft. Mm -hmm. But when you lifted that thing, the interesting part of it was that as you lifted the weight of the paddle wheel, the whole boat started to, to heel over because you were relieving it of 150 tons yes. hanging on one side. <laughs> and it would lay, lie over quite, a, quite an alarming angle mm -hmm. unless you had seen it done before. At that point, they would pull the shaft out into the engine room. And that also required taking the, the crank web off the other end of the shaft, mm -hmm. which is another story. And uh, then they put uh, wheel beams in, as they called them, which were big eye beams in from the freight deck uh, across the to the guard mm -hmm. through the paddle wheel and let the weight of it down on those wheel beams, yes, big I eye beams. So then as they lowered this thing down, the boat came back mm -hmm. even again and if you hadn't been there, you'd never have known uh -huh. uh, what was going on. Uh -huh. uh, those were the two major functions yes. for, for the big derrick. Now that uh, seems to me to be uh, certainly major work. Oh, that was major work. Now, was that type of work performed routinely? Well, I I should just rather say performed often uh, in the yard, or was that something of a an infrequent occurrence? I would call it infrequent. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to say reboiler a vessel, 
probably you do that maybe once or not more than twice in the life of the vessel. Yes, okay. But if you had 20 vessels, uh, I remember, as I say, after World War I when this new type of B&W boiler, bear in mind these were all coal hand-fired boilers. There was no oil burners and all that fancy business. Uh, when these new B&W boilers came out, they refitted most of the vessels, but I don't have any recollection. Mm -hmm. Of how many, but I do remember the. I do remember the Priscilla and the Commonwealth, particularly because I, I, I just happened to be there, I guess, at the time as a, as a kid. Yeah, yeah. As a nuisance. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> lifting the wheels. Uh, you could also use this for lifting parts of the wheels, mm -hmm. like for instance, let's say you had to take out one paddle, what they called a bucket, in those days. Uh, might, might have hit something, maybe gotten ice and got damaged, and you wanted to put a new bucket in, you could pick the pick the bucket up with this um, derrick if you mm -hmm. if you were lucky enough to be there. Right. Yeah. Uh, you could also get it out the hard way with chain falls. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of uh, secondary uses for this big gear, but the main part of it, I would say, was for and major engine and uh, paddle wheel. Shaft yeah. re re replacement. All right. Um, so the yard or the shops. Well, was it called? I mean, by by most people, was it called the shops? Newport shops. Newport shops. Okay. Um, the shops then could do any sort of repair to any of the boats, yep. except for dry dock work, Correct. as you mentioned before. Yep. And uh, so it was uh, uh, certainly an extensive uh, array of. Uh, of material and men and, and expertise there. It was. Now, I would I would qualify what what we've just mentioned to this extent that they could not manufacture their own shafts, for instance, mm -hmm. a 30-inch diameter shaft had to come from uh, Pittsburgh or some place where they had a gigantic big forge and machine shop arrangement, and those things were bought yeah. to design yeah. to mm -hmm. size. Right. Uh, now, do you have any idea how this how the shops compared with other similar shops throughout the uh, uh, the East Coast, say, in terms of uh, extents and uh, I would, manpower? Uh, well, as, as far as manpower goes, manpower in a sh shipyard is related to uh, the state of the economy and uh, it's a competitive game and, and uh, the average competitive shipyard, of course, uh, when they've got a lot of business, they hire a lot of mm -hmm. extra people in. And when they don't have, they they lay them off. Uh, that was not the case so much in the shop, in the Newport shops, because they had a steady year-round load of routine repair work that mm -hmm. had to be done uh, to these sort of a captive mm -hmm. uh, uh, group of, uh, of vessels. Mm -hmm. So I think that the employment there was quite a bit steadier than it would have been uh, in, let's say, one of the New York shipyards where you had the ups and downs of depression or, or competition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this being an in-house operation, you, you had your, your, your trade pretty much there and, mm -hmm. and captive. Mm -hmm. And it was always something to do. Yeah. Now, your father was the superintendent? Yes. And that was the, the, uh, the man in charge of the entire shop, is that right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, did he... Uh, was he brought to the shops from elsewhere, or did he live in Newport and, and become the uh, superintendent? No. Uh, let me see if I can recall it now. Uh, I mentioned to you that when Mr. Gardner became, uh, succeeded Mr. Pierce there in Newport uh, in the New England Steamship Company setup, that he designed uh, the Commonwealth. Yes. which was the new one. The Commonwealth was built in, the vessel itself was built in cramps in Philadelphia, but the engine was, in fact, I think that the master contract was put out to a firm in New York called Quintard Ironworks. And they probably subcontracted the hull structure to cramp. Mm -hmm. And they built the engines right there in the East River in New York, and uh -huh. there's the big shop they had there. Uh, my father, uh, my father's uncle, had been with Fletcher's in in Hoboken for a number of years, 
and he moved over to Quintard and uh, brought his nephew with him uh, as a young man. And the fact that he, my father, was working at Quintard when the Commonwealth was being engined, he went to, to Cramps in Philadelphia and, and supervised the installation of the engines and boilers and generally acted as a um, on the scene man for the prime contractor, mm -hmm. which was Quintard. Um, he got to know Mr. Gardner pretty well at that time because Mr. Gardner was the big boss there in Newport and, and he had designed the vessels and obviously there was a, a connection there. So some years later, okay, Mr. Gardner was nominated to go to New York as uh, vice president mm -hmm. in charge of the whole New England steamship operation, which was far more than uh, maintenance and repair. Of course, it involved the day-to-day -day operations and labor problems and financial problems and all the rest of it. And uh, he was looking for a successor and having known my father and my father having been quite familiar with the type of machinery and stuff like that, uh, he asked him if he would come to Newport and take the job, which he did. Mm -hmm. I have no ideas about the, what the alternatives were or anything like that. He uh -huh. kind of liked the idea of coming to Newport anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, do you have any idea about the um, the other workers then, if they were uh, hired from people who lived here in Newport? or if they were recruited, so to speak, from throughout whatever geographical area to come to work at the shops? I would say most of them were Newport people. I see. Uh -huh. I can't tell you for sure. Mm -hmm. But my recollection uh, of them was certainly they were, the vast majority were local people. I see. Newport people. Uh, I know when I went to high school in Newport, a lot of the boys and girls in, the, in my classes in school, their parents or their fathers worked for the mm -hmm. uh, Newport shops. Because mm -hmm. the other big employer, maritime employer in those days, was a torpedo station. Yes. But and that was a uh, that was a big labor market. But it didn't compare. And well, <clears throat> I don't know what the word is. Versatility, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah. with what the Newport shops had to do. You know, making the torpedo was one yeah. thing, and keeping a bunch yeah. of steamboats. Going, repairing everything from the boilers and the paddle wheels to the lid on the yeah. kitchen stove and putting in new wiring and all that was quite a diversified yeah. Yeah. operation. Well, you certainly seem um, proud of the shops. Uh, I wonder if, if you have any sense of whether or not uh, the general population in Newport was had the same sort of view. I felt there was a great deal of loyalty mm -hmm. there. Uh, I think that the people liked it. I think they liked working there. Uh, okay, do you want me to heat that up for you? Well, um, we were talking then uh, about the the uh, Newport's population attitude towards the the shipyard. You said you thought that. Uh, I think it was looked upon as a good place to work. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty steady. It wasn't all always perfect, of course. The in any place where there is a management and employees, there's an argument, a feeling, well, I ought to get paid more money. Uh, the shops were pretty strict about behavior. Uh, they wouldn't put up with any uh, uh, abuse of liquor, for instance. I, my recollection is there was no smoking allowed. Hmm. But that's years ago. That's mm -hmm. uh, old time stuff. We are working with vessels <clears throat> like the like the kind we're talking about, you can understand why there's no smoking allowed. Those things were, well, it's a, a miracle that they didn't all burn up. Mm -hmm. uh, they were most vulnerable, oddly enough, when they were laid up. When, there was, when, they were, when they were in service, they were manned and they had a wonderful system of uh, fire alarms and fire prevention and sprinkler systems and, and uh, uh, fire watch and all that kind of stuff, which they didn't have in under repair, mm -hmm. and that was a great worry uh, in, the, in the place was that somebody would light a cigarette and start a fire, and it's my recollection that f smoking was not even yeah. permitted in the yeah. office, oh. excepting perhaps maybe at noon hour, but yeah. I can't be sure of that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. on the job, no. 
Now, was that the, the fire uh, vulnerability, was that simply because there were wooden vessels? Yes. Okay, but there wasn't any other peculiar aspect uh, because of their uh, uh, marine nature or because they were boats? It was simply because of the wooden uh, <coughs> well, instead of the wood. It's quite astonishing, I think, to realize the, the lengths to which the management went in those days. And you can thank, I think, Mr. J. Holland Gardner as much as anybody f for initiating this, and I think my own father had quite a bit to do with it uh, later. Uh, those vessels had fire protection uh, built into the system that was never adopted in the American Merchant Marine until the Morro Castle caught fire in 1934 mm -hmm. and burnt at sea. I happen to have seen the vessel just the night before she caught fire. <laughs> she, uh, we wished we were aboard. We all said, oh boy, wouldn't it be fun to like all those nice looking girls and everything? Well, anyway, that's a different subject. After the Morro Castle disaster, uh, Admiral Shepard was then head of the Coast Guard. I think it was called the Bureau of Marine Inspection in those days. He had been assigned in Providence in the old days and as such had cognizance of the safety precautions at the Fall River, at the Newport shops and the Fall River line vessels, because he issued the, the, the steamboat inspection certificates at that time in this area. The first thing he did, he told me this, after the Morrow Castle thing, he said, well, let's go back and see what they did on the Fall River line. If anything should have ever caught fire, that should have, or those vessels should have that type and they didn't. What's the difference? So they had a little palaver and uh, came to realize that when these vessels were in commission, they had completely, they were completely fitted with sprinkler systems. They were completely fitted with separate fire alarm systems. Not that you didn't have to set off a sprinkler to know the damp ship was a fire. They were also fitted with a complete fire watch system two men on, on roving watch with a watchman's clock all the time mm -hmm. in service so, so that uh, if you smelt smoke or something like that, uh, he, he could smell it and he'd know there was some trouble somewhere. Another feature which helped there was that there was no enclosed space, no locker, for instance, that you could close the door and shut it off. Uh, there was a grill work over the door in every stateroom and in every locker and there were no enclosed space. So if there were a fire to occur in one of those spaces, the watchman would immediately smell the smoke, look, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now what set the Morrow Castle of fire was a locker that caught fire and that was not vented. And nobody knew that it was on fire until it was too late. Uh, those old vessels had wireless systems on them so they could communicate. Uh, uh, was sure. Uh, let me see, there was something else I was going to mention in that connection. Well, in any event, mm -hmm. uh, it must have worked pretty well. Yes. Because uh, they never had a fire of any consequence that I know of uh, uh, on any of those vessels. Well, it was uh, during service, I know. I understand. During service. Yes, yes. Um, in one of the books by. Um, Roger McAdams uh, mentioned that uh, only one passenger ever lost his life on a, a Fall River Line boat and there were uh, no serious mishaps in, in a hundred years, of, well, almost a hundred years well, of 90, service. Well, yeah. 90 years, I guess. Uh, that is so. Mm -hmm. And it was attributed, I think, by Admiral Shepard at that time to this type of watchfulness. Uh, not entirely. I mean, that wasn't the whole story, but he adopted that system that had been in, in, in practice here for years mm -hmm. and wrote it into the new rules, yeah. what was called Senate Report 184, if I remember right. And it, I was in the steamship business myself in those days, and, mm -hmm. and uh, some of it looked familiar to me. I said, gee, I think I remember that <laughs> <laughs> from my days on, mm -hmm. the, on the boats. So now that uh, type of carefulness then perhaps uh, also um, pervaded the shops as well. 
I well, expect. Well, you mentioned that the, none of them burned in service, but several of them burnt under repair. Yes. And that was a big thing that they were worried about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they kept watchmen all the time. Mm -hmm. But somebody was always afraid to, through lack of surveillance, some guy would light a cigarette or something, and then he'd see the boss coming and flick it in the corner. Yeah. Nobody would find it until midnight. They had their own fire alarm box down there at the Newport shops, box number 15, I can remember that. <laughs> Boy, if number 15 came out on the fire whistle, everybody jumped out of bed in a hurry around there. Uh-huh, yeah. Including my old man. Uh, hmm. So it was very much a concern, mm -hmm. and yes. they did their very best. Yeah. I know when, he, when they designed the new boats for the, for the uh, Nantucket, Vineyard run, New Bedford, Nantucket run. One of my father's great hopes was that the boat could be totally fireproof. And it was built, Albert Haas and, and he did, and, and my father designed them. And they had to make the upper deck, the hurricane deck, or what we call the boat deck, the very uppermost deck, had to be made ultimately of wood because to have put steel in there in the days before aluminum uh, would have affected the stability to the point where it uh, wouldn't have been practical. But except for that, even those little boats where they were taken, that was 1922 or three, somewhere in that range, uh, utmost uh, pains to make them safe mm -hmm. and fireproof. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, one of those boats is still kicking around the Martha's Vineyard. Oh, really? Yeah, they, our friends, some of our friends up here upstate are going to get it and and operate it as a, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, a kind of a floating museum. Yes. Uh huh. Called Friends of Nobska is the name of the group. Uh huh. And they've, I don't know whether they can do it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, do you have any idea why the shops were established in Newport? No. That's a darn good question. I don't even know how far back it goes, mm -hmm. yeah, but right. I suspect that uh, there was waterfront property available, which was essential. Uh, the location was good uh, because the boats, most of it was central, let's say, to most of the vessels. Yeah. Uh, it also served not only as a, a repair and overhaul facility, but as a layup facility in the wintertime when there weren't so many boats involved mm -hmm. and they needed layup space combined with it. And I suppose that they scouted around and found that was a, mm -hmm. a spot where a certain amount of capable labor was available mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, good waterfront facilities yeah. for layup. Yeah. Now you mentioned earlier that um, work went on 24 hours a day. Now was that uh, just in regarding well, I think it was an emergency repair you're talking about yes, specifically. Yes. But yes. otherwise, the work was just during the daytime? Oh, yes. The, uh, the, the standard day, well, I don't... I remember they had a whistle there, you know, they had their own power plant. Mm -hmm. A big, tall uh, brick smokestack must have been 100 feet high, I guess, just off Washington Street there. That was another landmark. And the steam whistle on the boiler not only blew the go-to-work signal at 7.30 and the noon whistle and the come back at 1 o'clock. I forget whether 4.30 I think was knocking off time. Um, but it also was connected into the town fire alarm system so that if somebody pulled a box somewhere in town it was one of the several uh, fire alarms in the town to alert the volunteer firemen and let uh -huh. the people know that there was trouble around there. Mm -hmm. Now you ask me, I don't remember where the other other fire whistles were. I think one of them was down at the gas house. And I forgot, yeah, I've forgotten yeah. now. But uh, then they worked five and a half days a week. And that was, what, a 44 hour week, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, later, I think what contributed, of course, to the demise of the whole business, the Fall River Line, and of course the shops went out with the Fall River Line and, and the other New England Seamship vessels yeah. was the uh, post-depression labor movement. Mm -hmm. And the 
inordinate demands, at least they looked inordinate to us in those days. Now, you know, you think, my God, if I'd known, known how little that was. Uh, it just made it impossible to man these vessels. Mm -hmm. uh, bear in mind, these were coal-fired every night. Some guy had to shovel enough coal into those boilers, those eight or ten boilers, to get that boat to New York. And the next night back, every night in a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, just after the Depression and coming up on World War II, uh, it, just not a, it was not a guy's idea of a day's work. He, it, it, it was passé. And the only thing they could have done at that point would have been to convert to oil, which had been studied and which would have been quite possible. But uh, with the advent of the Depression, the tremendous increase in highway travel and to a certain extent in, in uh, railroad mm -hmm. uh, travel and the, the horrible inroads of the depression on the freight side of the business which was quite important in places like New Bedford and Fall River uh, the, the, the main s substance of the trade had pretty much disappeared Guys were driving to New York in their own automobiles or taking buses or whatever. Uh, the train service was improving. And uh, I don't think any one thing uh, caused the demise. It was just fut the future of, of the ec economics, the mm -hmm. economy of the country. Yes, yes. Um, you talked about the, uh, the someone's idea of a day's work. Uh, I wonder if you can... Uh, talk a little bit about some of the types of work, some of the jobs um, that might not be uh, being done today. Uh, some of the um, uh, positions that uh, are no longer needed in... in well, there was a lot of, there was a lot of difference, uh, particularly just to name one, for instance, was riveting. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. To be a riveter, you had to be a pretty intelligent guy. And you had to have a... a, a gang there, a guy a rivet heater, a guy who knows how to heat, know how to heat a rivet mm -hmm. and how to throw it to a boy to catch it in a tin bucket. And then the two riveters had to know if the rivet was hot enough and how to put it in the hole and rivet it by it with a hammer so that it was properly done and looked neat mm -hmm. and tidy and all the rest yeah. of it. Riveting was the the way it was done in those days. Uh -huh. Now with a hammer you mean with a, a hand? Hand, hand? Had two, you generally had two guys Let's say you were driving one-inch rivets, mm -hmm. uh, inch and a quarter, one-inch rivets, probably even three-quarter rivets. Uh, they had a guy uh, who was a backer-upper, and he had a boy with him, and then they had a rivet heater somewhere, wherever he could be. In a lot of places, if you're working on scaffolding, for instance, in, uh, alongside the ship's side somewhere, uh, you couldn't bring the rivet heater, which was a coal fire, like a little blacksmith's forge. Mm -hmm. You couldn't bring that up there, so the, the youngster would stand down there, he'd heat the rivet till he knew it was the right temperature, and he'd throw it through the air, and the boy up on top would catch it in a, in a tin bucket. And then he would grab it with his tongs and hand it to the backer-upper. The backer-upper was on the unriveted side. He mm -hmm. was on the side where the rivet head stayed. Yes. And he would put it in the hole, let's say in the ship's side, let's say they're bolting up a new plate. Then on, and then when he shoved that into the hole and put his, his backing hammer against it, then the two men on the other side would see this incandescent rivet through mm -hmm. there and once it was in place, they had about, I would say, six or eight pound hammers. They weren't great big heavy mm -hmm. things, they were fairly light hammers. But then they would hit the rivet d dead on first, mm -hmm. uh, enough to swell it up in the hole. That was a trick of the rivet. It had to be had to be soft enough so that when they hit the end of it, oh, yes. and the backer upper was holding it from the backside with a fairly heavy hammer, that it would expand the rivet into the hole and completely fill the hole. Yes. So the first two or three whacks did that, and then while the guy was still holding it on the back, they would finish it off or put a head on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly on the outside of a ship, particularly, they would there would be a countersunk hole, 
and then it would fill the hole with the rest of the rivet head mm -hmm. so that it it was almost flush mm -hmm. because of course you didn't want something sticking out into the water right uh, yeah. and so they'd finish it up so it was practically right. flush with the plate right. now was there ever a time when the the uh, backer upper and the riveter were separated by a wall so oh yes they, now was there any sort of communication between the two I and mean, could they just yell or did or was there quite quite often not mm -hmm. and the they ju the guys would just wait on the, the the guys that were going to rivet the hammer up the rivet wait until the rivet appeared then they had certain signals that they could like a little language that the guy on the outside could tap or the guy on the inside depending on which what they were working on uh, they could tap on the plate and, and or whatever the signal was, three o'clock, I mean, three wraps, and then, well, we're finished, or we're out of rivets, uh -huh. or we're going home for lunch or something. Huh. So, now, yeah. was it common then that these people would, would work in teams? Would yes. it require a, a, a team? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. And they worked together, and uh, uh, they had to be pretty good, too. Yeah. I and mean, this was yeah. not, work, not work for... Uh, uh, unskilled people. This mm -hmm. required a guy who knew what he was doing and knew when he'd done it right and, if, and knew when he hadn't done it right mm -hmm. so that he could wrap on the plate and say that he'd done something wrong, drive the rivet back out again and then call for another one because it was possible for instance to, to lop the point of that rivet accidentally lop it over to one side mm -hmm. so that you couldn't hammer it back in to fill the hole neatly. Right, that would yeah. be hit right head on. Mm -hmm. Once you lopped it to one side, you never could get the body of it to fill. Yes. Yeah. And the, the whole point of the rivet was not to keep the plates from coming apart so much as to keep the plates so they wouldn't move in shear, if you know what oh, I mean yes. by in shear. Yeah, yes. That was where most of the strain came. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, I hadn't realized that. Yeah. Huh. And that's where every rivet hole after is, of course, they originally were punched in the shop before you put the plate, hung the plate up. Mm -hmm. And then you bolted the plates together. The boys call bolter uppers. But bolt these things maybe every sixth hole or eighth hole or something or other like that to the frames or to whatever or to themselves, to the adjacent plate, uh, to pull them up as tight as they could. And then when they started the riveting, they'd rivet in between the bolts. Mm -hmm. And then they'd back off the bolts, knock them out, and then finish up the bolt holes yes. with rivets. So the two plates would have to then be together as tightly as possible Correct. because the riveting didn't actually pull them together. Well, the rivet did much. help a little bit because little bit, when yeah. that rivet uh, 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 cooled off, mm -hmm. it did have a tendency to oh, pull the plate up. Mm -hmm. But it had to be pretty darn close to being right up snug. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the mm -hmm. final on a water. I mean, in a joint where you want it to be watertight, right. uh, the final uh, uh, process was caulking, mm -hmm. where you would go along the edge of the plate with a little fine chisel and just caulk it almost like you caulk uh, putty into a wooden seam, mm -hmm. which actually all you did was just set the edge of the plate up against the flat of the other, where they overlap. Uh -huh. huh. See, like for instance, well, here, like this, I don't know if I'm making it clear, mm -hmm. like this. Then, if this were the outside, yes. um, where the smooth rivets were and where the water was, then where that is, you take a, a thing that looked like a little caulking chisel, almost like a chisel, mm -hmm. and just tap it with a, with a hammer. Uh -huh. And just set it in for about an eighth of an inch, yeah. maybe, and set it in maybe, not more than an eighth of an inch, sixteenth hmm. maybe. Now how far? Light work, you needed light work. And uh -huh. in fact, World War, one, they found women made excellent caulkers. They didn't have to be tough, husky uh -huh. characters. They go along did a lot. Women did a lot of caulking. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, of course, they had uh, air hammers in those days, which you could uh, use if you had a lot of caul a lot of work to do. And the major riveting, where you were doing a mass job, working all in one place, uh, you could either do it up hand rivet, or you could do it with a Air gun, mm -hmm. and the air gun only to one guy instead of two. Yeah. The um, oh, how how far apart were the rivets then generally? Well, they were all calculated in the strength uh, of the structure that uh, you wanted. Um, uh, on the hull, say. 
Well, they were probably about five diameters apart, maybe. Let's say if you had uh, an inch, one inch rivets, maybe there'd be a hole every five inches. Mm -hmm. uh, there were codes for that. Yeah. I just don't remember. Yeah, but approximately five inches, yeah. say. Well, the, the American Bureau of Shipping, for, in for instance, or Lloyd's Register in England, had rules for that. Mm -hmm. And when you had uh, a ship of a certain type, and let's say you're working in the bottom of it, where you had to have the maximum strength, they would specify plates of certain thickness for certain size vessels, mm -hmm. and the number of rivets, and the diameter of the rivets, yeah. and all that all kind right. of thing. And now, once the rivet was heated, then, and, and put in through the hole, how long did the riveter have before it cooled to the point where it couldn't be properly worked? Oh, he would want to rivet that thing up, uh, I would think, within a minute, 30 mm -hmm. seconds if he could. I see. Yeah. I see. And then would it take the 30 seconds to do the job properly? Well, they did as quick as they could. Yeah. And uh, I would say you could do the major part of it probably in, probably 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then put the finish, if this was something like, as I say, on the outside or where it was to be visible, mm -hmm. or just to be do a decent job. Yeah. Uh, you'd finish the rivet head, mm -hmm. a cold finish it. Oh, I see. Uh, go over it with a, either a hand hammer or, or a light, fairly light air hammer, mm -hmm. and just smooth it off so that yeah. it didn't have dents and stuff. Mm -hmm. That was mostly for yeah. appearance. Yeah. Now, when the uh, when the rivets were tossed, I suppose sometimes some of the rivets were not caught. Once in a while, a guy would drop a rivet. Uh -huh. Would that ever start a fire? Yes. Was that right? Yes. In fact, that was bad news. If you were working on the outside of a hull, uh, I'm thinking more about a ship in dry dock or in a shipyard now, because in the Newport shops, they didn't do dry dock work, mm -hmm. but they still did a fair amount of riveting. Yes. But they didn't, but mostly from float stages, as they were called. If they had something to do on the hull above water, they had floats, floating yes. barge type mm -hmm. things, and they worked off of those. But working in the shipyard, one of the troubles there which I had to watch out for with those rivets was that. The rivet boy would throw a rivet up there, and the guy would miss it. And it would fall down and drop on a, on a plank, staging plank, because the outside of the ship was completely surrounded by what they called staging. So you could walk on it. I'll give it to you. Oh, thank you. And uh, the rivet would burn a hole in the plank, mm -hmm. or partway through a plank. And a lot of times the guys would make it through three holes like that. And they weren't all that smart that they would come and rather than renew the plank, they turn the plank over. Oh, mm -hmm. And one of the real, real booby traps you know, for the men working on those stages, oh, both the boulder uppers, as they would call the boulder, the original stuff, and the riveters themselves, was once in a while a plank would break with it, two or three burns. Uh -huh. So you had to watch that very carefully. Uh huh. huh. And uh, well, there's all kind of jokers <laughs> today with the. Uh, with, uh, What's this federal bureau now that does all the safety work? OSHA? OSHA. No, I don't know if you could build a, a ship the old-fashioned way today, and of course mm -hmm. nobody would anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, were there other jobs? Uh, that's very interesting, learning about riveting. Were there other jobs? Uh, oh, no. Uh, boiler, uh, some, something to do with the boilers, perhaps, that uh, you might not find today? Of course, the most fascinating thing about the boilers was the, f was the f firing firing a coal fire at sea when you're on underway. Yes. And that took a, a guy who uh, knew what he was doing or he'd wear himself out. Mm -hmm. And uh, these guys, you know, would hand, uh, they would burn up a hundred tons between Fall River and New York. So <laughs> two guys, uh, there were two, two uh, watches, so to speak. But when guy, the guys would start at four o'clock getting the fires ready in Fall River, and, and I think they worked till midnight, and the other fellows came on at midnight and worked till eight. After they got to New York, they had to bank the fires and hold them for the day and stuff like that. But during the working time, they shoveled quite a lot of coal. Yes. But there was a lot more to taking care of a coal fire like that on a hand-fired grate than pr the present day. Of course, it's all pulverized or it's great run on a chain grate or something. Mm -hmm. But the old hand-fired Fire was a little different story because you would get clinkers in the fire. You know how, had to know how to clean the fires, as they were called. Mm -hmm. Every so often, you'd 
move the fire to one side, pull out the clinkers, uh, then put the fire back where it belonged. Sometimes you'd have the misfortune to have a great bar break and drop from your fire level into the ash pit. Mm -hmm. That was quite a trick to put, put a new grade in. Mm -hmm. These guys, poor dumb stupid firemen, so called, they had to be, they worked hard and they had a skill that you, you, you couldn't be a fireman and be dumb because you'd wear yourself to death. Mm -hmm. You had to be smart enough to do the job right or you'd be exhausted by halfway through your watch. Uh, and they were good. Uh -huh. People used to ask me, who's the important man on board this ship? And let's say we were talking about one of the old Fall River Line boats, and I'd say, well, the captain thinks he is, and he <laughs> probably is, but we wouldn't get anywhere without the fireman or the cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a matter of fact, everybody had his job to do, and they mm -hmm. all did it, and did it mm -hmm. with the skill that was required. Yeah. Well, that's uh, uh, something else. Um, from reading a few of the books and from what you've said here, it sounds that the, like the, uh, the, the workers uh, at the shops and, and on the ships were uh, particularly skillful or particularly um, aware of, of doing the job right. Uh, I don't know if you have any idea of, of how the uh, this compared with, with other Because I have to tell you <laughs> that I think I'm prejudiced. Uh huh. A little bit. Yeah. Well, but, I, uh, I can imagine. Because it was a great thing. It was a wonderful operation to me, and I was fascinated by it, uh, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, oddly enough, I have two brothers, and neither one of them really got infected like I did <laughs> with it. They were smart, they went and did something else. <laughs> But uh, I was an oiler on the old, on the uh, Martha's Vineyard, the same one they're talking about oh, putting uh -huh. up here in, in mm -hmm. uh, New Bedford or, or Fall River now. That's when she had, that's when she was a steamer. Beautiful little triple expansion, four cylinder triple. And we had two coal fired water tube boilers there. Mm -hmm. They were very nice, B and W's. But that was, that was, that was something you, you just liked, that's all. Yeah, and all yeah. the fellows there were self-respecting, hard-working guys, and uh, I remember the chief engineer lived in Fairhaven. We we stayed overnight in New Bedford, and he used to ride his bicycle to work, <laughs> and then pull his bike up and put it on the freight deck and go down to Nantucket, come back in the evening, and he'd ride his bicycle back home again. <laughs> and uh, my job after we got back to New Bedford was to get the coal aboard. Mm -hmm. We had a coaling station down there, and we'd haul the coal over and get the coal bunkers for the next day. Or I guess it was more than, I don't think we did it every day. But the, the thing really fascinated me, and ultimately my own personal career is something entirely different. But um, I got interested in ships, and mm -hmm. finally I spent the rest of my life with the, in the shipping business. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. I was impressed by the skill and the intelligence and the ability of everybody, uh, not only on the Fall River line, mm -hmm. but although they were tops. I think for, for a man to go to sea today, I won't say today because I don't know because I haven't been to sea for years, but in those days uh, you ran into everything from the drunkards and the bums and the ne'er-do-well characters to the people who had pride in their in their uh, in the day's work mm -hmm. and in their in their future, 
and who went ahead and became engineers and mates and and uh, don't forget the cooks the mess boys got to be cooks and the cooks got to be chief stewards and and that's the, that was the way it went and the guys that had the self-respect were the ones that went ahead in the business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the other guys you know maybe they'd last a while and they'd drift off and you always had a certain element of that yes. but not too much well that's very interesting that uh, uh, so many of the workers were new porters. Well, in the shops. Yeah. Now that's what the, I mean. In the shops, yeah. On the boats, I think a lot of them were Fall River people, mm -hmm. or New Bedford, or from that general area. Uh, for instance, there was an old timer in Fall River who only died just a few years ago, who used to be was a mate on the. In fact, he was. He was a quartermaster, to my recollection, and he stayed with the Fall River Line until it ended, mm -hmm. and that was his life. And afterward, he he, he uh, took up shopkeeping in in Fall River until he died. Mm -hmm. uh, Self-respecting, intelligent guy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps too old then to go back to sea. Yes. yes. Chief chief engineer of the of the Priscilla. One of the most dignified and resourceful and intelligent engineers I ever saw in all my life wound up running uh, the, one of the elevators in the department store, McWhorter's department store. Uh -huh. I said, my God, you don't have to do this, do you? He said, no, I don't, but I enjoy it. I meet all my friends here. <laughs> I like mm -hmm. to do something, get out of the house. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of people they were. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, I know the, uh, I've spoken with other people and they uh, certainly appreciate and uh, enjoy, well, I guess the, the ships themselves when they're coming in and out of Newport at night with the lights on and the, and the grandness of the, uh, of the boats. It's, uh, did you have any, well, experience on the ships themselves? Uh, did you travel on the ships at all? Oh yes. Uh huh. That was a big thing, you know, for the any kids in Newport. We didn't call it the Fall River Line. We called it the New York Boat mm -hmm. because it was only one place we wanted to go was New York. <laughs> we didn't give a damn about Fall River. <laughs> but the big thing for us was, you think we're going to be able to go to New York this year on the boat? Wow. And that was a big aim in life, you know, and like young high school kids. And we used to go, and, and of course we knew enough people on the boats, Newport people, so they made us feel at home. And mm -hmm. Oh, that was a big thing to do in those days. Huh. That was more excitement to us than the kids now flying to Europe or <laughs> going to Florida for a spring vacation. Uh -huh. And... Uh, of course, the, the whole thing impinged on the people of Newport, and they didn't even know it. But the boats went through here twice a day. They went out and down from Fall River down here in the evening, and at nine quarter nine or something, they came up to the wharf there, and if you didn't have anything better to do, you went down and watched the excitement. Mm -hmm. They left at 9.25, and whether you went down or not, you could hear the whistle. Mm -hmm. And on a quiet night, you could hear the paddle the chunking of the wheels, as uh, Kipling described it in something that he wrote, I can't remember, not about that particular thing, uh, Gunga Din or something. Uh, you could hear those paddles and they were big powerful things and you got a, if you were a small boat owner around you, you got great respect right away for those paddle wheels and you didn't get in front of one of those <laughs> boats if you could help it. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, I don't know of anyone who ever got ground up in those paddle wheels. Mm -hmm. You'd think, sure enough, yes, that they would have chewed up some kid in a rowboat or something, but I don't know of ever, any such thing ever happening. Hmm. Or like a screw propeller, where you'd bounce along the side of the boat. If you got in the way, boy, you were, it was just no place to go. Yeah, yeah that's right. And they, they must have been very large, too. Well, they were approximately 20 feet, the, the, the width of the wheel, let me say, mm -hmm. the paddle, the part, the bucket, as it was called, 
must have been close to 20 feet long. And that was kind of four or five feet wide. When that thing came down, wham, down on the water, and the next one right behind it, it, it was just no way. Right. You know, so little, I don't recall ever mm -hmm. anything having really been chewed up in the way of a, another boat in that. Yeah, yeah. So, so one great thing about the paddle wheel, I told you about its efficiency and the, in the old days where it was really more efficient as an instrument of propulsion. Mm -hmm. But it also had tremendous backing power, stopping power. If you oh, wanted to uh -huh. stop one of those boats in a hurry, you could put the full power of that engine in reverse almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And the full and those wheels would operate as a as a mechanism almost as efficiently in reverse as they did going ahead. Huh. So if you want to stop one of those things in a hurry, you'd ring four bells and a jingle and there was all kinds of excitement. And they'd get stop that thing and get it turning backward. I don't know how long it took to take the to stop the boat, but you could take the, the headway off, the mm -hmm. major headway off in, oh, substantially less than a minute, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if he yeah. did see trouble ahead or saw that he was going to hit something, he could ring up four bells and a jingle when you were going full speed ahead. Mm -hmm. One gong, one bell was a gong, that meant slow, one more behind it meant stop, two more behind that, bong, bong, met astern, and the jingle met full speed, and the jingle was a, a tinkle bell rather than a gong. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and that was the language yes. that was spoken between the pilot house and the engine room. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays with the telegraph and the big indicator and all that kind of stuff, those fellows knew that language. I don't recall anybody ever getting mixed up mm -hmm. on it and doing, making a wrong maneuver. Oh, yeah, yeah. No? Now, when the, uh, when the boats were docking, did uh, tugs uh, help at all, or was it just the... Uh, and nor uh, the normally boat? speaking, they never used a tug. Mm -hmm. uh, they come into Newport, dock off the end of Long Wharf, which wasn't a very broad wharf, which meant the bow and the stern both were sticking away out. Mm -hmm. And they never needed a tow boat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If they wanted to swing the boat, they would either go ahead on a breast line or go astern. And uh, on a stern line, for instance, enough to swing the bow out. They'd go astern a little bit, hold back and cause the bow to, to swing out into right. the stream. Uh -huh. They were very clever. Uh-huh. Did you know any of the uh, the captains on uh, the boats? I knew them. I guess they probably knew me about, oh, God, here comes that kid again. <laughs> what am I going to do with him now? <laughs> but I do remember Captain George Rowland and Captain Gear and, oh, so, uh, so many of them. Captain Hamlin. Oh gosh, I hate to start naming people because you leave somebody out. And yeah. I say yes, I I I, mm -hmm. I think we knew him at that at that time. Mm -hmm. All of them, and the engineers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The, uh, you mentioned the work day from seven thirty until four thirty. Um, that was in the shops. Yes, right, yeah. right in the shops. Um, the and the whistle, shop whistle blew at seven thirty to. Uh, to uh, say, come on, boys, get to work. <laughs> no, when the whistle blew, you were either in through the timekeeper or you were late. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think they ever had a warning whistle. I don't think they needed it. Some shops they used to, or whistle places I worked, they would blow a warning whistle ten minutes beforehand. Yes. But I don't recall it here. I think it, the blue whistle blew at 7:30, and if you weren't in through the timekeeper by that time, you were marked late. Mm -hmm. And there was some penalty mm -hmm. involved in it. And I don't remember. Uh -huh. I know when we were when I worked in the Bath Iron Works, uh, if you weren't in ten minutes before seven, we went to work at seven in the morning mm -hmm. here. If you went through the timekeeper by ten minutes of seven, you were penalized, and I forget what for what the penalty was. If you weren't in there by seven o'clock. Uh, it was up to the foreman to decide whether he would take you or not. 
Hmm. Now, take you, you mean to for the bring you to work? I see. Uh, he he might he could he had the right. I mean, it uh -huh. and so then you would lose the day's pay. Then you lose the day's pay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. The uh, um, and the shops were were a fairly strict place to work. They Isn't were, that right? They required a good deal of discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, they expected it. As I say, smoking, being there when you were wanted, and drinking. Drinking was the quickest way to get thrown out. Mm -hmm. Any 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 of these guys uh, had got you know, a little bit drunk, particularly at noon hour. They knew they might just as well not bother to come back. Mm -hmm. It'd be better to take the afternoon off and tell somebody was sick uh -huh. than to come back with liquor uh -huh. on you because yeah. they, they just out you go and that was permanent. Uh -huh. They may have reconsidered for this. Yeah. Anybody got fired for being drunk was no longer a candidate for for employment hmm. there. Well, I'm sure that that there were cases right. where, where they were yeah. treated in, in, a, in a much more well let's say some some circumstances. Mm -hmm. But normally speaking they, they had yeah. to be. Well I was going to say that's probably in part due to the um, uh, safety factor of being able to uh, Absolutely. Uh, it's a, it was not the a penalty against the man. Himself, it was because he was putting his fellow employees in danger. Mm -hmm. I suppose a few of them sneaked in there somewhere and they buried them somewhere and hid them away until they sobered up. But generally speaking, they weren't uh, allowed in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you like this. Uh, you asked if everything <coughs> except dry docking was done. I have to qualify that and I forget if I did or not. To this extent, that the big forgings or big castings or stuff like that, uh, they had to buy yes. outside. For instance, they needed a new propeller shaft or something. They would buy that from a, some guy who whose business was making big steel forgings and machining big steel stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, castings they made in the shops. They had an excellent pattern shop made their own patterns for casting. Mm -hmm. And that was a kind of quite a, quite an art in those days because the making a pattern meant you had to make something and allow for the shrink of the iron when it was poured into the mold so that when you got through you had uh, the iron hadn't shrunk mm -hmm. below the dimensions you wanted. Oh yes. So what they used in the pattern shop was a sh was called a shrinkage rule and instead of a one foot rule it was, I think, one and an eighth or something like oh. that. And uh, you'd lay, the, all, the whole thing was expanded by whatever that was. Mm -hmm. So your pattern was actually bigger when you put it in the sand. In the, we, that stuff mostly went to Taunton or Fall River or Providence or someplace where they had foundries. Mm -hmm. And let's say you wanted a casting of some piece of machine or whatever. Uh, They'd make the pattern in the sand with the pattern that you gave them, take the pattern out, prepare the mold, pour the iron, or bronze, or brass, or whatever, and uh, then when it cooled, it would shrink, and then when you finished it, uh, smoothed it down, mm -hmm. that was taken care of in that part of the business. In other oh, words, the yeah. shrinkage had, was allowed for in the uh -huh. pattern when a guy made it. That is interesting. Yeah. And then the pattern was made of wood? Yes, the patterns were made of wood. In the old days they were mostly white pine. And white pine got so expensive and so rare that they went to using mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> it must have become expensive. Yeah, huh. I remember them making, it wasn't really the grade A furniture mahogany. Mm -hmm. But it was mahogany, just the yeah. same. And uh, I remember that. I can't tell you when this was, but I think it was in the middle 20s uh -huh. or something like that. Now, did the uh, did the shops then have a certain amount of, uh, of um, casting capability? No. You, you said that mo most things were sent away to be cast. They what? might they might have been able to make some few tiny castings. I see. Mostly casting to be efficient has to be at a place where you can melt this substantial quantities of the material, yes. iron, steel, 
bronze, brass, mm -hmm. whatever you want, uh, in fairly large quantities. Nice. And that takes a big furnace, and it takes something that you'd want to use quite often. Yeah. And it was cheaper if you, let's say, you wanted to make 50 uh, castings off of one pattern, mm -hmm. or one mold, uh, to do it in a in a shop where they they were also right. that same day yeah. they were making castings for 50 other guys maybe yes and they'd get they they'd run the heat the metal up and then they'd have a run on it and they'd not only pour your mm -hmm. uh, five castings or whatever but probably 50 or 60 more mm -hmm. other guys who wanted cast iron or cast brass or whatever right so that was just a mass production yes. Yeah. Style of yes, but the patterns though themselves were made. Uh, they were made Newport. right right there in the Newport shops yeah. by yeah. the pattern makers, and they were excellent craftsmen. Mm -hmm. They all had to be not only tailored for shrink, but what they call draw a pattern had to have a little bit of shape to it, so that when you pulled the mold out of the sand, that it would pull out and it wouldn't. Uh, jam or oh, I, oh. Well, a little bit of taper I guess what uh -huh. they would call draw. Oh I see yeah, yeah. so that so that the pattern could come out of the sand easily and leave yeah, the yeah uh, that's right. Huh that's not something you'd think about normally. Is no it? it isn't. Uh-huh. It isn't and, and uh, uh, a pattern maker had to be a pretty skillful fellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, if you were a molder and you were making molds and the, uh, one of the most aggravating things was not to be able to get that pattern out. They were designed, you could make them top and bottoms, because something like that. The mold generally split in the middle, mm -hmm. and when you made a top half and a bottom half. But in order to get the thing out of the sand, you could tap it just a little bit and screw a little hook into it and pull it out. But if it didn't have that draw right, you'd start to pull it out and just at the last minute, it would knock one corner off the side of the sand mold or something, you know, and it could start to do it all over again. <laughs> oh, that, that was an aggravation. I did some of that work myself. Uh -huh. but, uh, so that's where a good pattern maker knew how much draw you needed, but he didn't put so much on that you actually had a V-shape. Right. Right. Huh. Uh, were there any women who worked there in the shops? Oh yes, because uh -huh. there were women in the office, um, Newport people, very nice people. Uh, the storeroom, uh, the upholstery department, I think the upholstery and linen shops were the major employers of ladies who did a lot of mending. You know, nobody realizes it when you're, you got a fleet of 20 some vessels carrying passengers every night back and forth. There's a hell, hell of a lot of sheets, blankets, and pillowcases. Yes. And uh, all kinds of things tablecloths, napkins. The linen uh, business was a big business mm -hmm. for those people. Uh, and bed clothing, bed clothing, sheets, blankets. Uh, curtains. Um, upholstery. All these chairs were all upholstered. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was a big thing. And there was always somebody there reupholstering chairs or some guy burned a hole in it with his cigarette pot or something. And there were thousands of chairs sitting around in the dining saloons and, yeah. and a place where you could sit in the evening and mm -hmm. listen to the music. Now, I'm sorry I can't tell you about how many because mm -hmm. I yeah. just don't remember. Yeah, yeah. But there was employment there for women. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Hmm. Hmm. Oh. Um. Okay, there we go. The web is what 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 uh, is the crank, really? And they were all painted red on these boats, and most of the pictures you see, you see this big red crank. It's what made the shaft go around, and it was a a big. Uh, I think they're all forged steel. I'm not positive of that. Each crank piece weighed about seven tons. The working end of it uh, had to be bored for the shaft, so it had a 30-inch hole in it. It had a two and a half inch hole in it. 
so that the frame of this thing was probably uh, four, 40 inches or more in, in diameter, the outside mm -hmm. of it. The length of it was perhaps, I ought to know, was half the stroke. It would be roughly six feet, I guess, mm -hmm. six or seven feet from center to center. Uh, but that went on the end of this 30 inch shaft, mm -hmm. like a like big crank. You yes. could make it go around with on the engine side. Right. And uh, that thing weighed seven tons, and to put it on, you had to hang it up right at the end of the shaft in the engine, mm -hmm. in the engine room, heat it with torches to expand it so that the hole would get big enough in the, this 30 inch hole, uh, in big yes. enough so that when it was hot enough you could slide it on to the end of the shaft, uh -huh. put it in position, position it exactly right and then put a 4x4 four four steel key in there yeah. which was about, oh I don't remember, 16 inches long or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, watching him heat that thing up and getting ready to put on there with these great torches belching out because <laughs> they they built sheet metal guards around them so they didn't yeah blow fire all over the place but that was quite a show uh -huh. too and then the uh, the crank would would uh, contract in as it cooled yeah as it cooled the uh, as it cooled it would shrink what was called a shrink fit it would shrink on the end of the shaft mm -hmm. uh, so that it uh, was intended never to move it yeah. had a key in it also. Right. But between the two of the things that they were guaranteed not to move. <laughs> and that's a, that's not an unusual a way of, of uh, fitting uh -huh. up engines. Uh -huh. uh, this happens to be on a big scale. Yeah. Now how long would it take to heat up something like that? Oh, not too long. Um, I would think about three hours maybe. <laughs> Seems like a long time to me. Yeah. Well, they wanted to be pretty sure mm -hmm. that it was uniformly heated yes. all the way through. And it would come up to a point where it was red hot. I mean, mm -hmm. you could see it. Because mm -hmm. when they took the junk away and slipped that thing back on, they had to hang it from the uh, chain fault above and then sl slip it on there very easily because if you got it cocked the least little bit, it could jam on you. And then the idea was to get it off real fast uh -huh. before it shrunk where it was supposed to be. Yes. Then you then you were in real bad trouble. Uh -huh. So it was had to be done with great precision and skill. Mm -hmm. It looked easy, you know. Oh, that's how they do it. Yeah. You just shove <laughs> it in there, brother. The boss himself was watching every instant oh, of that. Really? I'll tell you. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, uh, but that's the way they build crankshafts. Yeah. That's the way they build them today. Uh -huh. the, but that's done in the machine shop when they're building that yeah. thing. This had to be done in the engine room mm -hmm. of the engine. Yeah. Quite interesting. Yes, it sounds, it sounds like it. Well, it, so, it sounds uh, like there was a great deal of, of skill oh, yeah. in, uh, in all sorts of areas. Mr. Collins was the outside machinist foreman. Mm -hmm. And he was the right guy. Boy, he knew exactly what he was doing all the time. Mm -hmm. And so did all the others. Oh, they were just knew their business. Huh. Um, for instance, when you were, when they were taking the last of the Scotch boilers out, uh, the the hatch where the boilers out was at more or less at one end of the fire room for s reasons of well structural reasons of one sort or another. Some of the boilers were way back under the deck. So how are we ever going <clears> to <throat> drag those 40, 50 ton monsters down here to get them out so we can drop the derrick, fall down and pick them up? So it didn't bother them at all. They just built an inclined plane and rolled them down. <laughs> <laughs> Let them roll free. Uh -huh. so they rolled down this, what a, what a horrible noise with dust and great bars and ashes and stuff. And, this one goes vroom, vroom, vroom. That must have been quite then a they, roar. They build a little catch for it down mm -hmm. there, roll down, rock back and forth two or three times, and then they drop the swing <laughs> down and off she went. Sounds easy. <laughs> Sounds easy, doesn't it? Huh. And now how, uh, how big uh, in dimension would something like that be? 
those huge boilers. I'm sorry you asked me that. Oh. I guess they would be about, let me say 15 feet in diameter mm -hmm. and perhaps 12 or 13 feet as cylinders across the heads. Mm -hmm. See, they were just cylinders. Yeah. And uh, the famous type of marine boiler, mm -hmm. as it's known as a Scotch boiler, until somebody came along with something better. Yeah. Goodness, that's quite a piece of machinery. They were it? very heavy. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. In fact, they helped keep the weight. That's what they needed in those old steamers, was weight in the bottom for stability. Oh, is that right? And when they put the water tube boilers in in place, uh, they had less weight involved there, and they actually had to put bed ballast in the hull. Mm -hmm. Actually put cast, uh, uh, concrete and put a lot of scrap iron and stuff in there and just put it in the bilges and hmm. leave it there till, uh, <laughs> just to put weight in the bottom of the boat. Yeah. The yeah. stability, stability, mm -hmm. of course, is a big, very important thing mm -hmm. in any floating object. And with them it was important because they had so much top hamper and oh, so much stuff up above. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's see, I have a, a list of a few things that happened. So you were you were there perhaps from you said from 1917 to 27 or so. I was only there uh, having an awareness. Yes. Of, of it, I would say from uh, the, the early 20s, just in the maybe 1922 to 27, something like that. Uh -huh. 1927, I graduated from high school. Uh -huh. My father died the same year, uh -huh. and uh, I had no reason to come back to Newport, so uh -huh. I took off. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Came back in 1972 to James. <laughs> yeah, it was quite an accident. They had a lot of stuff there, though. It was really, really interesting. That mm -hmm. I think I've mentioned most of them, the power plant where they made the electricity, the machine shop, Shrinking the crank work is a carpenter shop and the joiner shop, which is two different things. The carpenter shop did rough mm -hmm. carpentry and the joiner shop did the fine work, yeah. the interior paneling and mm -hmm. uh, oh gosh, that furniture and all that kind of stuff. They were beautiful guys. Pattern making I mentioned. The paint shop was a big deal. Mm -hmm. An awful lot of painting could be done both outside and in, and the inside painting was interior decorating in the finest sense. Yeah. There was yeah. no going out and slapping on see the robot jump. That and varnish and finish and piano finish, everything, a beautiful paint shop. I told you about the storeroom and the hawsers and the carpets and the upholstery and the linen. And the blacksmith, I think I mentioned they had a fine blacksmith shop. They did a lot of their actual forging, mm -hmm. making all kinds of forged stuff for themselves and forging stuff which was later finished in the machine shop, or parts of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the big derrick. There was a wireless station there for a time. Oh, really? I don't know whether that really belongs in a discussion like this, but I remember that. Uh, it was fascinating in those days. Mm -hmm. I think it had something to do with the sort of aftermath of World War I. And it meant they were communicating, and we used to go down and listen to them communicate, not only with the Fall River Line boats, which had radio, and which incidentally was part of their safety program. Mm -hmm. uh, so they could immediately communicate if they had any trouble, break down the machinery, or if they had a fire, or something like that. Everybody knew it instantly. It wasn't a question of somebody waking up in the morning and saying, that looks like smoke out there. Uh, they had the old rotary spark gap in the in the, this wireless station. I don't. It's in the paddle wheels. Wood bearings. Wood, wood, wood bearings. The pin was bronze, because that was in salt water all the time. That's all it was like. The steel pins were bushed with bronze bushings, mm -hmm. shrunk on. 
uh, that in this case was the moving part, the rods that connected with these pins uh, were steel rods and they had bronze bushings, in, I mean lignum vitae bushings inside them. So that you had a bronze pin and a lignum vitae uh, outside bushing mm -hmm. and it would, the salt water was enough to lubricate it oh. so that it didn't wear out. <laughs> And I've seen lignovite bearings, propeller shaft bearings that uh, lasted for years. Hmm. Sometimes you wouldn't have to what we would call rebush the lignovite, maybe once every six or seven years. Incredible. Yes, it is. Well, I know it's a very hard one, but uh, I certainly wouldn't expect it to stand up to that. Stood up beautifully. Hmm. And I suppose today they have rubber. Hmm. I know they have rubber. Some of it's hard rubber, some of it is other materials, but they're not wood like lignum yeah. vitae you cut out of a tree trunk. Yeah. They're synthetic things. Mm -hmm. The old Block Island served as a restaurant down there at the Newport shops. That's a point that you might find of interest. Uh -huh. She ran to Block Island for years and she ran on the bay. Her name was the Block Island. Yes. Yeah. Looked a little like the Mount Hope. She got to uh, 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 I think the steamboat inspectors, or she, anyhow, she lived her, her useful life as a as a navigable navigable vessel. So they tied her up there in the Newport shops, over in the slip toward Briggs Wharf, and uh, used her as a restaurant. <laughs> and I can't remember who ate there. I think it was mostly for the crews of the vessels who were there in there for repairs, and maybe they didn't want to keep the galley crew. And maybe some of the shop people. I mm -hmm. don't remember who the hell ate there. But I ate there every once in a while. I'd bomb a, I used to go, go over there and look hungry, you know, and the, <laughs> the fella, that, the guy in the galley, he'd say, come here, wait a minute. He'd get me out a piece of brand new uh, baked bis bake bis biscuits or some cake or something that they had made there. Give me a dish of rhubarb, but oh God, it all tasted wonderful. <laughs> Well, I wonder if that was Newport's first floating restaurant. Probably was. Yeah, it's something that you might want to ask somebody about who remembers it. Yes. If they want to know what was the worst hazard around the Newport shops, it was probably me. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was trying to keep me out of trouble. <laughs> God damn kid, how the hell did he get in here? <laughs> Of course, you were the boss's son, weren't you? Well, they didn't have to put up with that. Uh -huh. And my father was as conscious of it as anyone. Well, I'm, yes, I'm sure he must have been. And uh, if I hadn't behaved myself and showed some genuine interest, not only in what I wanted to know, but in what the crafts that, uh -huh. and the men who, who um, were doing this work in a respectful way, he would have kicked me out before the other guys would have. Yeah. Yeah. And he was very, very conscious of the capability of the people, mm -hmm. having been through it himself. He started as a blacksmith's helper himself mm -hmm. in Fletcher's yard in Hoboken. So uh, they weren't telling him anything he didn't know. Mm -hmm. And he just could swing a hammer right there with the rest of them. But he didn't, he respected them. And that's what he inculcated in me, was to have a respect for what any kind of work any man did, if he was a, if he was a craftsman, if he had some, if he was worthy of it. Find out what he did and how did he get to do it and what's good about it. And the Newport Shops was a great place to observe that kind of stuff. Yes. Everybody there had a self-respect mm -hmm. in what he did. Even the seamstresses, they did. Uh, I think that I think we've been over most of it. Uh -huh. Okay. I didn't. I did try to name the vessels, but I haven't got them all here. Yeah. Seven, eight, My recollection is uh, we're over twenty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That uh, use that place as a base yeah. for repair, maintenance off layup uh, 
So, you better take that back, and maybe by the time you've listened to all that, you figure you've got more than you more than you wanted. <laughs> Here we are again at the home of Richard Berry in Jamestown for the second interview. You started to say something when I interrupted you. Was that something you wanted to say? Uh, no, no oh. I, was going to, I just was going to mention Stevenson Taylor, but oh, we can okay. come to that okay. as we go along. All right. Well, um, one of the things uh, that I want to uh, discuss was what might be called uh, life aboard the boats for passenger and crew. Uh, and you said that you had uh, had traveled on the uh, uh, the boats to New York. Um, I was wondering about the passengers, perhaps. Were there different travels of, uh, or rather, different classes of uh, passenger travel? Uh, no, not specifically. <clears throat> what you could do was, uh, if you wanted to be a passenger, you paid your fare, and then you bought a stateroom. I see. And you could buy anything from a very swanky stateroom with a big double bed in it and beautiful decorations on the ceiling and, oh, as we would say, overhead, I guess, in the steamship business. Mm -hmm and the bulkheads, the walls, and really quite grand appearance, um, all the way down to a little uh, two-bunk stateroom, which are, are, we call it a cabin, I guess. But they were all called staterooms, but there was not much state in the little two-bunk mm -hmm. rooms, one above the other. Yeah. But they were completely useful and comfortable. They had the washing facilities in them. In the early days, it was a it was a washstand with a pitcher and a, and a catch bucket in it. Mm -hmm. Later on, when they got running water on the boats, then they had brought it up to date, so you had yeah. hot and cold running water. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people traveled in the, in the bunk fitted rooms because they were cheaper. They were smaller, but all you wanted was some place for overnight. It was certainly more comfortable than the railroad train. Uh, like a sleeper on a on a railroad train, it was a little bit more commodious and more private. And you could close the door, and at least you had your own privacy. Yeah. Uh, then there was an area below the deck, uh, below the main deck, and I think it was located differently in some of the different boats. But it was what we would call steerage, I think. And you could go there and sleep if you did not have money or did not want to spend money on a stateroom mm -hmm. or a cabin. So that your four dollars and forty-four cents or whatever the fare to New York was in those days uh, didn't mean you had to sit up all night. You could go down into this place, and it was something like a, a little bit like a sleeping car, uh, rows of of bunks, comfortable bunks with curtains to pull across. And uh, <clears throat> I can't remember whether they were segregated for ladies and gentlemen or just how it was done. I, I, that doesn't come back to me. Mm -hmm. Probably mostly men went down there. I don't think women went, mm -hmm. went into the steerage. Or if they did, it was a separate compartment. Mm -hmm. But yes, you, you, you could, even if you just had the, the, the travel fare without any stateroom, you could uh, live in a dignified fashion for the night. Yeah. Sleep uh -huh. comfortably and uh -huh. mm -hmm. that was all right. And how long a trip was it? Well, let's say from Newport, yeah. the boat uh, left here at 9.25 in the evening and arrived at uh, New York at the dock at 7 o'clock in the morning, so mm -hmm. it was about nine and a half hours. Uh -huh. Now, was that uh, the actual time that it took to make the distance? Or was the seven o'clock arrival time more convenient than, say, five in the morning? No, no. Uh, they ran at a, depending on the state of the tide and the weather and so forth, at a good clip mm -hmm. uh, to make their seven o'clock arrival. They were they were pushing it, but that was uh, just what you call a, a good normal scheduled run. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, if they got involved in heavy fog, uh, they couldn't even go into New York Harbor. 
and then you'd get landed at uh, over on Long Island. Oh God! They had a, a, a reserve dock on the Long Island yeah. shore just before you went into the East River, somewhat near where LaGuardia Field is now, I would say. Yeah. And you could they could make that in the foggy weather without having to navigate the complexities of the East River. Yeah and uh, land you there. There was a Long Island Railroad spur. They would arrange for a train so that you could get in there maybe at six in the morning, you'd be on the train and take you up to New York and get you there at seven o'clock anyway. So there was rarely a time then when weather, say, forced a, a, a late arrival in, in New York City. Very rarely, uh -huh. yes. Or in the opposite direction. You'd leave New York at 5.30, I think it was, Around about that time. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, later than our competitor, because it was the which was the Eastern Steamship that ran from New York to Boston direct. Yes. Uh, because that gave people a little, little bit more time after they quit work to get mm -hmm. down and catch the boat, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, eastbound, you get to Newport. I think it was around 2:30 in the morning. And they'd stop here and unload whatever uh, freight they had brought up and whatever passengers wanted to get off at Newport at that hour of the morning. And a lot of them didn't mind it. Um, and then go on up to Fall River. And, and I think the boats were in Fall River at, oh, five or six o'clock in the morning. And then there was a boat train right on the dock there that took you nonstop to uh, Boston. And you could either have your breakfast on the boat or on the train. So New York to Boston then would be after work, and you'd arrive in Boston the yeah, next by morning. Eight o'clock in the morning. For yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Were there? Uh, well, what uh, was there nightlife on the uh, boats for those who wish to partake? <laughs> I guess you might call it nightlife. Uh, during most of my period that I can recall, prohibition was in vogue, yes. and there was no liquor sold on the boats, and the, and the old uh, bar room was closed, uh, or either that or it was a little coffee uh, bar or something in there. Uh, prior to that time, I understood that they had very uh, well-equipped bars, and that people could go there and drink as they wished to. Uh, I don't recall any talk of of misbehavior or drunkenness or anything like that on the boats, with the exception of some of the young college boys who would attend a football match somewhere. I may have mentioned this before. Let's say the Harvard boys would go to Princeton and and they'd win a game down there. And of course, that was a sign of great celebration. And prohibition or no prohibition, they always managed to get <laughs> something to to hoop it up on on the way home. But that was a rare occasion, and everybody understood it and allowed for it. I don't recall any damage or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. Was there a band? Or they had orchestra? an orchestra, a very nice orchestra, a string orchestra with a piano, and they used to play contemporary pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, either a little bit jazzy or a little bit sedate, depending on whether the crowd wanted to waltz or whether they mm -hmm. wanted to sit and listen or what. So there was an element of judgment on the part of the band leader. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have some photographs of that in the m museum at Fall River. And we also have the piano, the grand piano, uh, that came from the Commonwealth. Oh, oh in the museum? In the museum, yeah. There. Now, on the, uh, the run from Newport to New York, uh, which started at 9.30, um, would dinner be available that late uh, in, the, in the day? I don't believe so. So it's not my recollection. I, I can't answer that question. Uh, I just don't remember. Yeah. But now, from New York uh, eastward, pre oh. I presume that... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. And, and, of course, from Fall River. Uh, Westbound dinner was ready, available 
for the people and most of them would come down on the on the boat train and then have dinner on the boat mm -hmm. because it was quite a treat. The cuisine on the boats was excellent. Yes, that's what I understand. And the prices weren't too bad. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And people sort of looked forward to getting their stuff in the stateroom and simmer it down and maybe brush up a little bit and then go up and have a really nice meal or down or wherever uh, into the dining saloon and, and the food was top notch, as good as the Waldorf Astoria anyway. Um, nicer than eating on the train, you know, yeah. just trying to eat on the train with everything slopping around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have seen some photos, I think, of um, uh, the dining room very richly appointed. Was that the only dining room? Were there Was there another dining room, say, for, uh, well, that was less, uh, uh, was more common or perhaps um, not to my not to my knowledge. Yeah. I don't believe so. Uh, so I, I would have to say I don't I don't remember anything so but the dining saloon. So all the passengers then had the opportunity to eat in this uh, very grand uh, dining. Saloon. Yes, and you went and paid for your meal. Yes, you could have steak or you could have cornflakes, but uh, whatever. And the 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 prices were not. Uh, uh, exorbitant at all. I mean, they're very much in line with what you get in any good restaurant. Uh, but it was available to any passenger. Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh -huh. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, they may have had a, they may have had a uh, some place for other people, but I don't remember it. Uh -huh. uh, you could always eat before you got on the boat and eat after you got off if you didn't want to buy a meal on the boat. Yeah. Now, do you have any idea of how? Many passengers, or what percentage uh, of the passengers say uh, were from Newport and came to Newport as opposed to going on ultimately to Boston? I would say m most of the year the percentage was small mm -hmm. of Newport passengers. Um, I, I don't want to try to name a figure, but there wasn't an awful lot of people traveling back and forth between Newport and New York in the winter. Yeah. That'd be 20, 25, 30 people, I would say would be perhaps about what you might expect. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, in those days we had quite a lot of Navy people here and they comprised some of the, of the yeah. uh, uh, passenger list. Mm -hmm. Um, and other and commercial people and people like him who wanted to go to New York to see the movies or, or go to the opera or visit their uncle or something like that. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't a big percentage in the winter. Mm -hmm. In the summer, however, in the, at the height of the summer, Newport was quite a big um, part of the passenger list. Yeah, I can and, imagine. And uh, in fact, the whole line. <coughs> really prospered in the summer because the demand for space was more than they could handle with one boat. And they used to double up in the summertime and put two boats on the run each way. One boat direct from Fall River to New York and, and, the, and another one coming in the opposite direction. And then the big boat, the Commonwealth of the Priscilla, the two big ones, would uh, run the regular run from Fall River to Newport to New York yes. and then back the same way. Uh, to accommodate the demand at that time. Now, I'm talking about the, maybe the prosperous days. What happened after the Depression? Right. I would assume that dropped off quite a bit in the 30s, and then automobile traffic got to uh, to be more popular at that time. Yeah. So, but in the heyday, in the 20s heyday to me anyway. <laughs> uh, yes, there was a, it was a real stepping stone for New York people, was, uh, Newport people, I mean, to get to New York, mm -hmm. and but especially in the summer. Yeah. Lots of the wealthy people used to come up Fridays and go back Sunday nights, and uh, it was nice for them. They could be with their families on the weekend. If they didn't happen to do it on their own yacht, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which some of them did. Yes. 
and the uh, the boats ran uh, year round, or I should say there was service year oh, round. Oh yes, yes, mm-hmm. year round, no breaks, no nothing. Now, do you have some sort of similar estimation about freight uh, to and from Newport? The freight to and from Newport was seasonal, and I think a lot of it depended on the fishing industry. There was a lot of fish was caught here, brought into Newport and shipped through that evening to New, New York and was sold in the f- market the next morning. Oh, I see. In the Fulton Fish Market partic- yeah. particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember specifically uh, any other mass movements like that that occurred from New York to, uh, from New York to Newport. But I'm sure there were household goods and probably Navy stuff and general stuff that came back and forth, parts of post and, mm-hmm. and whatever. Uh, the main cargoes, however, on a year-round basis related to, to a great extent to Massachusetts industries in Fall River and Brockton and Boston and areas like that, where there was a commerce there of as I think I mentioned before, uh, cotton, yes, bale cotton going north, and uh, cotton, manufactured cotton mm-hmm. goods, uh, piece goods, uh, or printed material, back to New York. Mm-hmm. They go into the, to the dress industry there, and the clothing industry, which in New York in those days was a big thing. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, lots of shoes that used to come from Brockton to Fall River and down on the boat. Um, and I think from other places, shoes in other of the Boston uh, shoe centers, mm-hmm. Brockton, I'm sure of. But I have a feeling I remember stuff coming through there from Lynn and from the uh, Hood Rubber Company that made sneakers. Mm-hmm. And I forget where they were, some of them, somewhere up around Boston. So there was a, a very substantial amount of uh, cargo or freight, uh, as they called it here, which was good for everybody. Uh, that was really one of the one of the really important factors in making Fall River and to get off the line a little bit to New Bedford, making them manufacturing centers, was that they had cheap and daily access to the main market, which was New York, mm-hmm. both directions. Yeah. So it it not only was a a passenger uh, facility, but it was also an industrial facility, Mm -hmm. commercial facility from that point of view. Yeah, yeah. Fall River never would have been the place it is without the the, uh, commercial service that they got from the Fall River boats. Well, and it certainly was a commercial center for uh, uh, textile. Oh, yes, yes. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Now, here back in Newport, uh, was there a 24-hour um, activity uh, receiving and unloading cargo and passengers and processing and whatnot, aside from the shops, um, down at Long Wharf? No, I, I would say that maybe from 8 in the morning until well, normally five or six in the afternoon, and then of course everything was opened again at eight, from eight to nine thirty when the boat was expected, yeah. and they had to get the freight aboard. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most of the receiving or delivery f- uh, of incoming stuff was done during the business day, as yeah. it would in any normal yeah. freight uh, mm-hmm. terminal. Uh-huh. And uh, there was an office down there. It uh, was under the charge of a Mr. Charles Gardner. A very nice man who uh, built a house that's right on the corner of Willow and Washington right now, in the northeast corner. Uh, oh yes, uh, kind of a I know that. R- red brick. Yes, house on that corner. Mm-hmm. Yes, right across from St. John's Church. Yes, uh, they were very nice people, and he was uh, in, in, he was the agent mm-hmm. for that operation. And all the receiving and all the all the uh, deliveries 
And the people that did that work, and the men that loaded the boats, what we would call longshoremen, I think the steamboat line called them freight handlers. And that was all his business. And he hired them, and, he, and he, the solicitors who went out and drummed up business uh, worked through him. And uh, Same thing in Fall River where Mr. Clark, John Clark was the commercial agent there, and he did the same thing in, in Fall River. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, a lot of, it was a, a really handy thing to have overnight service from here to New York, especially, oh, yes. especially for the perishable aspect of the fishing business. Because mm -hmm. those fish were in New York 24 hours after they were caught. They were packed yeah. in ice, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that um, solicitors drummed up business. Now, that was uh, salesmen who went to businesses and uh, commercial concerns here in yeah. Newport to encourage them to uh, use the freight service of the, uh, of yes. the lines, is that right? Yes, that's a common practice, uh, not only in steamship lines, lines, but truck lines and the railroads and everybody else. They have salesmen, the same as you'd have in a department store. Mm -hmm. But they know the business, they know the rates and the schedules, and uh, they can say, look, what we, we can do this for you, and we can have it delivered to your consignee at a certain time of day, or if it had to go, let's say, beyond New York, they would arrange shipment beyond to, uh, well, Philadelphia or whatever. A lot of coordination mm -hmm. that invited the uh, people to ship on the line. Yeah. And to them, service was important. Mm -hmm. Well, this is certainly a service business, isn't it? Yes. But how many, how many uh, solicitors there were, or who they were, I, yeah. to this very day, I, I, I just don't know. Well, that was just something I hadn't thought about. Before. Yeah. It would be salesmen, basically, for the... Yes, yeah, so it was a contact, because these people are your customers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were just as important as the passenger mm -hmm. customers. You, you try to please everybody, give them the service they want, and explain to them how much it's going to cost, and then don't let them down. That's the important thing give them the service that you said they were going to get. Yeah. And a lot of them incorporate that into their way of business. Say, oh, I can do this here, and I can sell it there, and I know I can do it every night. Well, that's one thing that I've, I've understood from you and from some of the books I've read, that, that the, um, the uh, service of the line, continuous service, uninterrupted service, was. Uh, was very high and very good for years and years and years. I, you could pretty much, it was dependable. Mm -hmm. And it was a rare occasion, even if they were overbooked, even if things got really good, mm -hmm. and they were overbooked, they would put extra service on. If necessary, they'd run a freight boat uh, over a, 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 a line that wasn't able to accommodate the demand at that time. Mm -hmm. Because they had several freight boats as well as passenger boats. Yes. Mostly they didn't run in as subsidi uh, as uh, um, in support of the passenger lines. They had their own routes, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they would run routes in the winter where there was no passenger demand, rather than having a passenger boat go there mm -hmm. where there was a freight demand. So it gave them a little flexibility. Yes. Uh, boats like I, you've probably seen photographs of them. That the superstructures were painted black. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, the, the upper decks were right. white, but the most of it were painted black. Vessels like the Mohegan and, uh, oh, I, I, I really should read my lesson up, but uh, there were several of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the minute I can't remember how many, but certainly five or six. Yeah, yeah. To supplement the uh -huh. freight demand. Uh, one thing else I wanted to ask about the uh, passenger aspect, uh, was there room service perhaps available or sandwiches and coffee, say, available uh, throughout the night, throughout the entire run? I know that there was porter service available. You could uh, press the bu buzzer or uh, whatever and uh, there was always service available to you by a uniformed porter. Mm 
as they were called. I presume you could get room service. I have to assume that, but I just don't remember. Yeah, yeah. The service was good, mm -hmm. and the uh, the uh, dining room waiters uh, s substituted or filled in or supplemented the porter service because when they were not serving in the dining room, they were available to do the kind of work you're talking about. There also, of course, had to be um, men or, or there to to uh, make up the beds and and change the sheets and all that kind of stuff during the day. I mean, it was a big hotel operation. Mm -hmm. And when you got to New York and uh, eight or nine hundred people walked ashore, you had to clean that place up and get all the laundry out and tidy up the rooms and make them up for the for the next night with clean linen and the whole bloody business. Mm -hmm. So the stewards department was a busy bunch of people there. Now, do you know uh, how the watches for the work day was scheduled for uh, for the crew, or for say, say the, uh, the porters? Uh, Ian? I don't. I'm ashamed to tell you I don't. Uh, I don't remember. All I can say is that when you needed all of them, they all got out and worked. And that would be at sailing time when you were embarking passengers, bringing their baggage in and showing them the, to their rooms, helping, helping them get their stateroom key and get them in the room and then make sure they were happy. Uh, same thing in the morning when they came down for breakfast and they wanted to get ashore with their baggage. Um, uh, and that made dinner and breakfast uh, times busy times but during uh, one thing I wanted wanted particularly to know was if you knew um, how many cruises back and forth or runs I guess they were called any one crewman or any uh, crew would make and what sort of uh, import times they would be off or how many days they'd be off and how many days they'd work, something like that. If you had any idea about that. I I don't have much of a, of a good and official idea because I don't know. All I can tell you from my own experience when I was steamboating that we worked seven days a week and uh, for as long as we wanted to work, if we wanted to get off, why we'd say I don't want to work next week and they'd get another guy to substitute for you, but you didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. um, we had in port, when we were in, in, in this particular case, it happened to be New Bedford, anything after we finished our day's work, we could go up town to the movies or do whatever we were damn well pleased, as long as we showed up, showed up on the job again, sober and ready to work in the morning. But of course, we slept on the boat, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was just fine. We'd go up and go to a movie or something, come on back, and that's all we ever asked for. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of them, a lot of the, the crews were very steady and stayed on the boats. There yeah, they'd be in New York one day, and they'd be in Fall River on another day, depending where their homes were. If they lived in Fall River, as quite a number of them did, as soon as they got their work over with, they'd go home. And spend the day with their families. Until it was time to Until sail. Until it was time again. to come yeah. back, say at five o'clock or whenever it was ready, time to get your uniform mm -hmm. on and start rustling baggage or getting rooms ready. So there was some time available, some, some leisure time, time available yes, in court. Yes, but uh, not an awful lot by today's standards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And of course there was work to be done in port too. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, you had to have a donkey watch in the fire room, somebody to keep steam enough on the boilers to keep the generators running and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, in the, as I mentioned, in the stewards department, somebody had to make all the beds up, get rid of the dirty laundry and all that kind of stuff. Now, <clears throat> to what extent they had supplementary help during the day, I can't tell you. I just don't remember. Yeah. Because none of that really occurred here in Newport. 
No, that all here, happened at the terminal. Yeah, the boat was here for only 45 minutes or no, so. No, nothing. Uh, in Newport was nothing from the, as far as the, uh, the day's life aboard the vessel. It was just an interim interruption. Yeah. But uh, at, at the terminals, <coughs> I'm sure they got time off uh, to do what they wanted, but mostly they would take it at, at the end where their families lived or their friends were they wanted to visit. A lot of them were foreign women people. Uh, I, I just can't tell you what happened in New York. Yeah. I just don't remember. I guess probably some of those colored boys were New York boys. Well, now that's something uh, you mentioned before, the, the stop here in Newport. Then there probably wasn't much um, uh, interaction between the crew and the repair people. No, it's, very little. Uh -huh. The only, only time you got interact, interaction between the crew and the repair people would be if it was an accident or something where they have to go over and do a job and work all night or something like that. But for the normal maintenance, there that was done in the winter, uh, well, let's say in the winter, in the off-season for yes. that particular boat. Yes. And the crews were laid off then, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, or were working on the, on the active boats, yeah. let's yeah. say. So the crews probably had very little contact with, with Newport. Not then. much. Not uh -huh. much. No. I, I, I remember a lot of the people on the boats, including the captains and the chief engineers and, and the senior officers, and they were not Newport people. They came from Fall River or Taunton or New Bedford or up in that area. Yes. And I think some from New York. Uh -huh. um, I wish I knew more about the colored crews, uh, but all I can tell you is that they were hardworking, self-respecting, very fine people. Mm -hmm. And to us in those days, whether a man was black or white meant no difference whatsoever to us. We never thought of it as being different. Mm -hmm. We went to school with colored people. Maybe you want to erase this afterward. Um, where I lived in Newport, there was a colored group that lived right over our back fence, and we played handball with them every day, we went to school with them, it never would have occurred to us mm -hmm. to draw a line of distinction between a white and a black. Well, it's very interesting that you say this, and with the conviction you say it, because uh, another man whom I interviewed on the same uh, project, although not about the Fall River line specifically, yeah said the same thing with the same conviction and the same, uh, well, I desire to convince me that... Really? Yes, and it, it, you a, two sound impressive. very much the same. I, that's I, interesting. I, yeah. Um, well, now, the how about the, the engineers, say, or other work groups in the ship? Were they uh, equally white or black? Or was there a mixture in, because uh, you mentioned that the stewards were primarily all um, black men, were the engineers say? Were they no, white, the, were they black? <clears throat> there were not, I don't recall any black officers. Mm -hmm. And that's just a statement of fact. Yeah. Uh, why, I don't know. Uh, a black man had a hard time in those days, in retrospect, getting recognition and education, and a lot of them uh, perhaps, uh, I maybe just didn't aspire to it, or maybe they had some other reason. But the answer is no, I don't remember any black officers. That don't, doesn't mean there weren't any. I just don't remember them. A lot of the senior officers had had um, deep sea experience before they came with the line during my time. And I remember, I, maybe I told you, that Captain Hamlin, I think, told me that he had made something like seven trips around Cape Horn in a couple of ships, mm. round trips, before he uh, got interested in steamboating. And a lot of them had had deep sea experience yes. prior to that time in sail, what's more. Yes, yes. Uh, the engineers, of course, were a little different, and they mostly came from from uh, local fellows who got interested and they went to uh, 
and got jobs as oilers or firemen or whatever, and some of them liked it and some of them didn't. Uh, but the, oddly enough, the, the name is called the Black Gang. Mm -hmm. But the Black Gang was the, was the engineer's crowd. Mm -hmm. But that word black didn't have anything to do with color. It, was, it arose from the fact that they got pretty dirty from shoveling coal, and so they referred to them as the Black Gang because they came out of there with coal dust on them. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm gone too today. Uh, the engineers were fellows who had ambition enough to go ahead and get licenses and uh, become licensed engineers and rise to chief engineer and, and looked upon it as a profession. Mm -hmm. And they were good too. Could you discern any sort of um, quality about the officers who had had experience in sale? Looking back on, on that time now, could you discern any, that quality? Not necessarily. I would say no. Uh, the fact that a man had been to sea and had been in sail and had been in foreign countries and all was romantic. But I don't think he was any better, any better seaman or officer mm -hmm. than the fellows who grew right, right up with the line. I really don't think so. What... Um, well, let's see. How strict a control, say, did the officers have over the crew? Uh, oh, very. Can you make a comparison between that time and, and, and the same sort of control now? Well, I can only do it, and I, I hate to bring up the subject, but they were all non-union at the time, and they sort of liked their jobs, and uh, 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 you didn't have the intervention, that's maybe the wrong word from a labor <laughs> point of view, but I, the intervention of the union delegates and the rules and the collective bargaining and all that hocus pocus. If the guy worked there and if he liked it, he stayed, and if he didn't like it, he quit. He went somewhere else. But there was no quick cracking, there was no abuse, there was absolutely nothing amongst the officers on those vessels that the crew could complain about. I mean, they liked it. Mm -hmm. That's why they stayed there. Yeah, yeah. And they had quite a lot of respect for what they did. The only work, of course, the working crews worked oh, only only half the trip. I mean, they didn't work all night. The firemen that shoveled the coal and the oiler that oiled the engine and the engineer, they had two watches. Mm. So they'd start from Fall River and at midnight they'd be finished. Mm -hmm. Then the second gang would take on at midnight and take the boat to New York. And when they were finished, they finished with engines, as the saying goes. Uh, they were tied up safely, then uh, certain uh, groups of them, numbers of them, were assigned as donkey men. And they would work during the day to keep, as I mentioned, the fire in the boilers, or a couple of boilers, and uh, that kind of stuff. But they would rotate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember whether they got extra money for donkey work or not. I can't recall. Mm -hmm. I remember on the vineyard line, we had a donkey Fireman, he came at night. We ran during the day there. And this he came and didn't belong to the crew at all. We, we got in and tied the vessel up. And he'd go down and keep the fires on standby overnight. And then in the morning, the fireman would come down and take over. Mm -hmm. So he was a member of, of the crew in effect, but he never went anywhere. Yeah. Uh -huh. Were you aware of any uh, professional competitiveness, say? between the engineers of the crew and the uh, uh, repairmen and maintenance men who would work on the engines? Was there anything no. like that? No, none at all. Mm -hmm. They worked together, they wanted to get the job done the best way they could because they knew, the operating engineer knew that if the repair guy didn't fix it right, he'd have to fix it himself after. And the repairmen knew that too, so there was no troubles. I don't remember any job that was ever sent out that wasn't in 100% operating condition, at least in this crowd. I've seen the shipyard plenty of times where the machinist gang didn't do the job right and the ship's crew would have to do it themselves after it, sometimes after they got to sea. But uh, those are little things we don't like to mention. But I don't remember anything like that, particularly in the Fall River, New England Seamship Company, where they had their own repair yard. 
Yeah. Which means. Yeah. Oh, well, that would make a you're difference. You're on the it? same roof. Uh -huh. you're, we're buddies together. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in the shipyard, the call it, uh, the shipyard guy wants to get the job done as cheap and fast as he can, and then he knows he doesn't have to live with it. He goes back to Hoboken or wherever he came from. Ah. That's it. Well, that might have uh, made a difference in the uh, overall dependability of the, the ships and the line. In I, th that the I think it did. Mm -hmm. but, and I don't want to impugn the, the good shipyards yeah. like, like Fletcher's in Hoboken or Robbins Dry Dock in New York. When they went down to do the dry docking work and stuff, it was done well and carefully. But within the company, I don't know of any cross currents such as I saw and everybody knows about um, in what I was called the merchant marine around the world of arguments between the captains and the deck officers, I mean the engineers and the captains and the deck officers and the, and the engine crew and that kind of stuff. But, uh, that, that just indicates, in my opinion, uh, a poor morale. Mm -hmm. And that is up to the people that run the ships, and not the people's fault on the ships, as much as it is as the operator who's should say to him, listen, if this is the way it's going to be, both of you get the hell out of here and we'll start over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, the ascendancy of the unions, that's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah. Oh, yes, I know. Yeah. We have a good, I, I'm talking about a different situation, nothing to do with the Fall River Line, but I was with the steamship company where we had remarkably good relationships with the union, and that helped. But I saw unhappily the other side of the coin, and it was bad. Mm -hmm. There's always a battle on between the union and the engineers, or the deck officers and the Siemens Union, or something like that. There's no place for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea how how large a crew would have been on, say, the uh, Commonwealth or the Priscilla at any one time? I don't. Mm -hmm. I think we ought to try and get some some f practical, factual information on that. Yeah. I, you know, I pick a number, a hundred out of yeah. the air, but, but right. I just don't know. Yeah. Right. Because the bigger boats had more, right. smaller boats had less. Mm -hmm. Later on, when they got, no, I take that back. I was going to say later on, when they went to oil burning, there would be less firemen and no coal passes and stuff. Yeah. But I don't think that the Fall River Line ever got to the oil burning stage. Mm -hmm. They were coal up until the day they shut down. Right. So that meant you had to have a bigger engine crew. Because you had to have coal passers. They were guys that went and got the coal from where it was, up in the bunkers and brought it down dumped it uh, near enough that the fireman could get at it with a shovel. And a lot of complexities like that that you didn't have on an oil yeah. burner. Uh, you mentioned another job, the oilers. Yes. Is there a uh, comparable um, work category, say, now on a... Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, I with just didn't diesel, recognize the name. Well, indeed, with diesel vessels, which most of them are today, they're called motormen, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do perform the same function. They, they see if the, the things are working right and if there's anything that needs oiling, they oil it. And they generally stand a sort of a, of a constant watch in the engine room in support of the engineer who may be called away for something temporarily or uh, but just one more guy there. And an oiler or a motorman, or whatever they call them, uh, is a step above the fireman. <clears throat> In the old days, they had firemen, well, they had wipers. That was as low as you could get. <laughs> he cleaned up around the engine room and wiped the, the nice, shiny uh, machinery down so it wouldn't get rusty. And he polished the brass, and he swept up the place, and, and, and as a matter of fact, so did some of the, some of the oilers helped me. But fundamentally, that was the wiper's job, uh, keep the floor plates clean. Then you had the fireman, who I think was just a little bit a step above the wiper, as I remember, because the fireman uh, had to shovel the coal, and he had to know what he was doing. He had to be a man of some skill. 
and knowledge. And in fact, a coal-burning fireman had to be a pretty intelligent guy to keep from getting himself all fouled up. If he knew how to fire and listen to what they told him and learned that, then he could do the job properly. If he couldn't, somebody would have to teach him. Or if he couldn't learn, you had to get rid of him. Then in the fire room, the next step above that was a water tender. And a water tender was classed as a petty officer. Uh, he was sort of in charge of the watch in the fire room. Because yeah. we didn't have junior engineers in the fire room in those days. But he also, he and perhaps there were two of them on a watch, was their job was to keep the water in the boilers at the right level. You know, they have gauge glasses on yes. the boilers. You can see the height of the water in this glass too. Yes. And if the water was going down, he'd have to go over and open the valve a little bit, mm -hmm. make sure that more of the feed water was getting back into that boiler and maybe less into another one. And this was all in the days when all the um, water tending was done by hand. Uh, mm -hmm. Subsequently, or maybe even some other installations, they had uh, automatic feed checks, a, a float inside the oh, boiler yes. that kept the kept the water at, at its proper level without the uh, water tender having to mess around with it all the time. But you still had water tenders in the event that something went wrong. And you wanted to, or if you wanted to do something like cutting a boiler out. Uh, and that was the fire room crew. Coal passers, firemen, water tenders. Maybe overlooking of somebody, I don't know. Uh, and on the bigger vessels, like the ocean going vessels, they had uh, uh, engineers in charge of a watch, an actual fire room engineer on the big vessel. Mm -hmm. Then in the, in, the, in the engine room, you had a wiper, whom we talked about, uh, an oiler, and the oiler was also a petty officer. He got paid more than the others. Uh, the oiler's job was to actually oil the engine in motion. Uh, there was some automatic oil, oiling, uh, drip oiling stuff that came down from a reservoir and dripped, you hoped, on the right place at the right time. But it was a custom and the necessity in those days, not only with big, those ma massive side wheelers, but with the small. Um, well, that engine I was on was 1800 horsepower. And it turned 180 R revolutions, and it was a propeller job, reciprocating steam engine. Uh, but we uh, hand oiled that every 15 minutes, all the time it was running, which meant that you felt every bearing, and you supplemented the oil drip feed, which was nice to know about. But we substituted, to be damn sure, uh, with a can, an oil can. Huh. And now feeling the bearings, you could put your hand somewhere and feel the vibration and determine it. No, you felt the temperature. Oh, the temperature. Yeah. Uh -huh. Of course, it was a lot to being an oiler in, in addition to that because you could tell by looking and by smelling if you had a hot bearing, if you were alert. Because if a bearing started to heat up, it got a dull look. Mm -hmm. When a thing's got lubrication on it, it's slick and shiny. But if it starts to warm up, it gets a dull look, and then all of a sudden you start to smell this, yes. like a smoke. Mm -hmm. And then you get going right fast yeah. and uh, do something about it. Try, of course, to get supplementary lubricant to it. Maybe your little feet is plugged up, or you haven't been shooting the oil can in the right direction, you weren't looking at what you were doing. But mostly an oil is pretty damn careful, mm -hmm. because he doesn't want that to happen. That's much worse for him than taking a little trouble to, to oil the engine properly. Mm -hmm. So I that, and, and uh, the thrust bearings were another place where you could get in trouble if you didn't watch them. So that was the purpose of having the oiler. And it was a self-respecting job. Then on most ships above that, they had a junior engineer in the big ships. I don't remember if they had juniors in, on the Fall River Line steamers, but I think not. I think they had the chief and the second assistant took well, the first watch, which would be the departure to midnight, and the first well, assistant and the third assistant took from midnight uh, till docking. So, yeah, and so they gave you two engineers in the engine room at all times, mm -hmm. which was good because one fellow could be there to 
to answer bells, in other words, to maneuver if we're called upon instantly. And the other fellow could be around and looking to see that everything was all right, that the bilges were pumping, that the generators were putting out the right voltage and that kind of stuff. Um, one difference between the, the coastwise routes like this and deep sea is that you could be called, you almost had to be constantly um, on standby, as you would describe it, uh, ready to do something right away quick, mm -hmm. because you never knew, particularly if it was foggy or a little dark or rainy, where you're going to, maybe some guy in a rowboat gets in your way, or, or the sailboat at night, and you don't see him until the last minute. Yeah. You can't wait for the engineer to come back and come down the build somewhere to stop the engine. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they have a constant watch at the throttle, let's oh. say, practically. Yeah. Whereas at sea, particularly in good weather, and we only ever had one watch engineer on watch. And he could go on out into the fire room or he could go look at the auxiliaries and do whatever. But he did have a backup in the, in the uh, person of the oiler, who knew where he was, and if they did, they did get a message or something like that where he was needed in a hurry, he could either act himself or if he wasn't sure, he'd get the engineer back quickly. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have that liberty on the yeah. steamers because things happened all the day and fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, those vessels could go astern quickly and with great effect with the paddle wheels. Yes, you... Uh, uh, I may have mentioned you that. You did. You ma yeah. mentioned that last time that the paddle wheels were especially good for, uh, yeah. for that reason. Mm. So the engineer then, chief engineer, was in charge of the uh, engineering department yep. for the ship? Yep. Uh, and now, was he considered an officer? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, he's second only to the captain. Mm. The captain of the vessel has command of the whole vessel, and he can give the chief engineer orders. Uh, within the scope of the ship's requirements. But the chief engineer would be giving the orders within the department uh, because it's a specialty. And the mates and the captains don't know what the engineer knows about the mechanical part of it or the steam pressures and vacuums and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the, the chief engineer doesn't know about navigating and uh, particularly in the fog and stuff like that. So it's a question of the two of them working together. And they all, they always did. It's wonderful how they mm -hmm. knew and respected each other's the jobs. Mm -hmm. So they were the two key people aboard the vessel. The other one that I, I hesitate to mention was the cook. Uh, <laughs> because if you didn't get a decent meal, why the morale on the ship went to hell in the yeah. yeah. But that's not official. That's just a, that's my comment. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good cook made all the difference in the world to everybody. Of course, on those boats you had wonderful cooks, uh, and several of them. But on a ship at sea, uh, a freighter, see if you had a good cook, your, everything was rosy. But if you had a new cook or some guy who didn't know what the hell he was doing, or was an alcoholic or something, that uh, made a lot of difference in the morale aboard the ship. Um, then on the uh, the uh, steamboat, say on the Fall River type boats, then oh, there would be yeah. other officers who would be in, in charge of uh, uh, well, of the ship, I guess, at various times. Yes, you had the captain, and then you had a first pilot and a second pilot. Uh, the first pilot literally conned the vessel after it left, let's say, Newport and got out here to Brenton's, uh, then the pilot would take over and take the vessel down to where whenever midnight came, or whatever they had decided amongst them, and he was in charge of the navigation. The captain could go down and sleep or do whatever he wanted, visit amongst the passengers, do a little salesmanship, which was important. And the captain was quite an important fellow on those boats. Uh, so he was something of a salesman. But he still was captain of that vessel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. At at midnight <clears throat> or whatever, um, the first pilot would be relieved by the second pilot, who was also and these guys are licensed pilots now for the waters that they're in. Don't forget, by the Steamboat Inspection Service, as it was called in those days, now called the United States Coast Guard, 
and they were licensed specifically to pilot vessels of that speed and size in those particular waters. Mm -hmm. uh, and would be still today if they were running. Uh, and the second pilot and his crew would take yeah. over and they would go on in. He, he'd have a different quartermaster and had a quartermaster to do the actual steering. So you had a first pilot with his quartermaster and a second pilot with another quartermaster to do the actual steering. Mm -hmm. And uh, a bow watchman uh, also with each watch. And a bow watchman in decent weather would go up in the bow and report if he saw anything like a book without lights or anything. Just a lookout type mm -hmm. of fellow, quite an important guy. Uh, the, the deck part of it, other than the actual navigation, was managed by a chief officer and a second officer. The chief officer took care of <clears throat> the deck crew and gave them all their orders as mooring the vessel and unmooring the vessel, uh, taking freight aboard, where to stow it, how to stow it, to get it properly located and, and uh, uh, secured so that if the boat was rolling it wouldn't start sliding around. I don't know not to put dynamite alongside gasoline and stuff like that. I shouldn't say gasoline because gasoline was not permitted on those vessels, but uh, that type of yeah. juxtaposition they had to be on the lookout for. Um, and he was in charge of the, I guess you'd call it the first watch, I can't remember what it was called now. And then the second mate took over at midnight and he was there to take care of whatever had to happen. But a lot of their work was done during the day. And I can't remember whether they actually stood a watch at night or whether they, they were just available. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody needed something at night after midnight, they'd call a second mate. He'd get his crew out and secure something or something that had to, ha had to be done. An automobile was moving around. Mm -hmm. um, but then they had to be on hand to moor the vessel, to unmoor in Fall River, let's say, to moor the vessel again and prepare for the mooring in New York and then to get the freight to see if the freight gangways were up properly and that the freight was taken off. They didn't do it themselves but they yeah. uh, supervised it. And uh, then in the afternoon when the freight, the outbound freight was put aboard they were there to see that that was properly stolen and uh, taken care of. Now the actual hours I don't remember. But it was a good day's work for everybody, without being <coughs> Simon Legree type of operation. And mm -hmm. They were all competent men, knew what they were doing, and had a very distinct regard for the response. The captain then didn't necessarily have uh, any specific assigned seamanship duties, say. This, in addition to being in command, mm -hmm. which is a the re response, the responsibility. Yeah. It isn't like a, a general mode as where if you don't know what to do, you go ask the chairman, and if the chairman doesn't know what to do, he asks the board of directors. This guy, they ask him, and he's it. Mm -hmm. And there's an expression among seamen that you may have heard, and when they turn watch over to the the next man or the captain takes the ship over, he's told it's all yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means it's all yours. Uh, you can't run into the next office and say, boss, what do I do now? <laughs> so you got it, you're it. And if you get into a collision situation or somebody jumps overboard or you catch a fire or anything that could happen, a passenger's injured, anything that might happen, you you you're it, boy. There's no well, let's call the rescue squad. You've got to be a doctor and an advisor and a helper and make the decision. What do we do? Do we go to New York with this? Or do we go, take go into New Haven where we can get help or what? That's the kind of decisions that is inherent in the title of shipmaster, mm -hmm. captain. Uh, also, beyond that, uh, in bad weather. The captains all took the responsibility of conning the vessel in heavy fog or in any t time where, uh, not that the mates couldn't do it, I mean the pilots, 
Not that the pilots couldn't do it and weren't competent to do it, but he felt that was his responsibility and he wasn't going to turn it over to somebody else. Right. So he'd be sacked out in his bunk somewhere at 11 or 12 o'clock at night thinking, well, I'll get a good night's sleep, and next thing you know, ooh, and somebody knocks on his door. He's got to get his jacket on and go up there and take over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from that on, and on he's, he's the guy. And he says, steer this, steer that, stop, don't stop, blow the whistle. And uh, it's, it's quite a heavy responsibility, yeah. particularly when you get maybe a week of fog, mm -hmm. steady fog along this coast here. In April, I've seen it, where it was foggy every damn night for at least a week. Mm -hmm. and I tell you, that, that was tough on the captains because they would literally be up all night. Yeah. With a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, I'm sure, especially in a busy area like that. Yeah, and not, not only that, but they've got 1,200 people whose lives are all dependent on is doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was remarkable how, how wonderfully they responded to that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, one of them would go ashore due to, well, maybe an error in judgment, maybe to a, a, an unusual weather condition that was unpredictable, <clears throat> like an unusual set of the tide. Maybe there'd be a hurricane offshore somewhere, and nobody think much about it. But that hurricane changed the direction of the Gulf Stream, or changed the this effect of the tide. And the tide, instead of running this way, might run this way, set him sideways. And he had no means of knowing that in the fog. Great on a nice clear night. Oh yeah, there we are. There's the lighthouse. But by going ashore, you mean he? I run aground. Run aground, I should say. Okay, well, I'm so, okay. I I should, I, I, it's not, I, I, I'm confusing the two terms. Yeah. Uh, he could run aground. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And that happened from time to time. I think I mentioned to you, one of them ran right up on the rocks here at Port Weatherwell. Yeah. Remember another one that got on Great Gull Island. He was eastbound one night. And uh, that was agreed by everybody to have been due to a, an unusual set of the tide across the sound, and it only runs east and west. Mm -hmm. Through some fluke in the weather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, oh God, it, was, it was incredible how well they did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Because today nobody would take a paddle wheel to see him as right mine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you can get a propeller efficiency today that's equal to the paddle wheel, maybe a little better, I'd say today, and will withstand the pitching and rolling and the heaving of the vessel and all that, which of course, the, and the breaking seas, right? Which you couldn't do too well with a paddle wheel. Mm -hmm. Even with these paddle wheels, sometimes off point duty, they'd be getting a Big C and it may break a break a radius rod or knock a bucket out of the wheel or something. And that's when the engineers had to know what to do. So on the sound, the sound was more protected then. Very much. Oh, and that's why the paddle wheels could continue. Exactly. To be used. They had protected waters all the way practically until they got to Point Judy, uh -huh. and then they had about an hour, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, a pretty open ocean. When you came out inside of Block Island and turned and headed up into the bay, particularly in the southeast gale, it was coming all the way from Spain, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they would slow down, take it easy, they knew what to do. That was a little uncomfortable for the passengers, but passengers liked that route mostly simply because they had such little exposure to the open ocean. Well, around uh, Cape Cod all the way to Boston, I know that would have been a they, That was a miserable then. ride. Miserable for everybody. Mm -hmm. And they had to be fast in order to make this, the schedule. They had to go fast, and of course, the faster they went, the worse they felt the mm -hmm. ground swell. Although the Eastern Steamship did run that route. Of course, after the Cape Cod Canal. Yeah. It wasn't nearly as bad. All you had was from Cape Cod to Boston. Light there, and that was fairly exposed. Mm -hmm. But they ran that like about three hours, two hours, two and a half hours.
And that was your choice, whether you want to go that way and run that risk, or whether you want to come up to Fall mm -hmm. River and take the train. Yeah. And the train was only a couple of hours, perhaps, hour and a half, maybe. The train from Fall River to uh, uh, Fall River to Boston. I think it was about an hour and a quarter, an mm -hmm. hour and ten minutes. It was a non-stop special train. Right there on the wharf, and we wound up in South Station. Mm -hmm. Maybe they stopped at Back Bay. I'm not, I don't remember. But there was a hurry-up train. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, they didn't mind running trains fast. Our friends on, what do you call this? Amtrak. Amtrak today. Their schedule is slower than it was with hand-fired coal steam locomotives when I was a kid. Oh, really? Huh. Look up the old New Haven Railroad timetables for mm -hmm. the... For the Merchants Limited, and I think the other one was called the Knickerbocker or something like that. And they ran from New York to Boston. And they stopped at New Haven, and I don't remember where else they stopped. But they were the two. One, one left each end at 1 o'clock, and the other in the afternoon, the other at 5 o'clock in the evening. I think that time was four hours flat. Mm -hmm. And even Amtrak, the last few months when they were running what they call the Metro Liner up there, they didn't make it in four hours to fly. Yeah. Even with the super steam, I mean the super diesels, guys sitting back there, nobody had to shovel coal in that thing. Well, I wonder if the track is in uh, disrepair, or at least not as... Gee, the track ought to be good. Yeah. Because you've seen it, my God. If you go over there to Wickford, not Wickford, Wakefield, Station there, and that track is all concrete ties and oh, the latest thing. I know there is a little old track uh, west of New London where they do have to slow down a little bit, but still in all, uh -huh. I can't tell you why they can't do as yeah. well today as they could 60 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we're uh, my wife and I are considering. A uh, uh, vacation next summer, uh, or next, yeah, next summer, or perhaps this winter, and we're considering taking the uh, train from Montreal to Vancouver. And I think that's about four and a half or five days, and uh, we'll have a you can buy a suite which has two rooms rather than just one, and uh, I think it might be fun. I think it would be very interesting. I understand it's a pretty, pretty nice, high-class ride. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what uh, what we understand. We haven't really looked into it much, except to know that uh, that sort of a, a route exists. I don't, I don't in, in any way wish to discourage you, but I'll tell you a story about a <laughs> fellow we had. You know, I was worked for years for the old United Fruit. That was the banana business. We had big fleet ships, including passenger ships which reminded me of the Fall River line. But one of our captains, our senior senior captain, as a matter of fact, he turned out to be the Commodore at one time. Uh, I guess it was during World War II, he was in, in command of some naval vessel out in the Pacific. He came back and the World War got over. His wife went out there to join him on the coast. And he said, see, I think I've had enough sea going for a little while. Why do you say we go home by train? And uh, his wife said, sure, that's all right with me. But while I'm out here, I'd like to see some of the mountains. So, okay, we'll go up to Vancouver, and uh, then we'll take the train from Vancouver back to Montreal. Well, they loved it. Well, they got on the train, and they went up along the shore, you know, because that's a beautiful ride yes. from San Francisco mm -hmm. to Seattle and Vancouver. Maybe they took the boat up to Vancouver, I don't remember. And oh, the trip out from uh, through British Columbia, they were just overjoyed. But then the next day he said, I might as well have been back at sea. It was just level uh, grain country there for uh, the next two days or two uh, and a half days or something. That was his yeah. reaction to it. Yeah, yeah. But I read a lot of, of people, comments of people who had time to study the terrain and knew a little bit of where they were going and the history of it. Who loved it, loved it. Much better than driving a car, they told me. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, you, you don't have the, the responsibility of driving yourself, and uh, you, oh, can you can just relax. sit back and take a look around. And, yeah, you can relax. Driving a car today, particularly you get to be my age, you got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Let's not get you some more hot coffee. I don't okay. know what happened here with the uh, coffee, but I think just let me warm it up. A okay, bit. alrighty. So Ollie Race, a little.